So I was uh, told that you have a different background and that you, that you are not climate experts. So, so when I talked to Marcus a bit about this, I, I, we, we said that I, I'm going to tell you, give you some kind of fundamentals about how the climate system works and also talk about climate models, how they are constructed, since uh, these models are used widely and the outputs from these models might be used by you as well and then it's good to have some idea about what are the uh, strengths and lim limitations of these models in, in, in the context that you're working with them. So please uh, think about questions etc and we can uh, take that over, over time here. So the first part, uh, there are two parts, there will be one, one part on the climate system and global climate models and then afterwards I will go into talking more about details on the regional level, talking about regional climate models. And these parts, I mean, they, they, are, um, they are related to, to each other, so they're not completely separate. And I, but I will try to keep on here now, and I know the important thing is that we have lunch at 1.12.30 it is. And uh, you can also help, help me to take the time, and we should have some short break in between somewhere. So, to go to the fundamentals on the climate system, uh, as I can also tell you that my background is from metrology. I started out as a for weather forecaster, so, so my background is really in the atmosphere. I'm not so, uh, uh, I don't know the in-depth in knowledge in the ocean and in the other parts of the climate system, but uh, so I stay rather much in, in the atmosphere, but we can also talk about the other parts as well. Um, the climate system, it's uh, quite a complex thing. This is an old picture we, we often use and it, uh, the climate system it, it, uh, consists of different parts. We have uh, the atmosphere that is connected through exchange processes to the oceans and to lakes, these are the water bodies, and then also of course connected to the land surfaces with exchanges between the atmosphere and the land. And then we also have connections between land and ocean and land and, and sea of course where we have runoff in the rivers for instance transporting water and uh, chemical trace constituents etc from land out into the ocean. And then uh, uh -oh. this one tells me that I should connect to somewhere but I don't connect so sorry about that. Uh, so if we want to talk about the climate system, we really want, need to talk about all of this system, including internal processes within the different compartments, like the atmosphere, we can have processes in here, or we can have processes in the ocean. And we, then we have to talk about the exchange processes between these different compartments. And then we also have to think about external factors, like the sun, with its radiation that uh, influences this system. And then we have also, of course, all of the changing things going on here. We ha can have the anthropogenic forcing when you, uh, mankind is changing concentration of greenhouse gases, for instance, in, in the atmosphere, or changing other things. All of these things influences the climate system, which is to be seen upon in, in this uh, whole context. So this is what we need to understand. And I will take as a starting point here, look at, the, at, at what is driving this climate system. And this, of course, the sun and the, the radiation from the sun. And uh, we start by setting up a very, very simple climate model. This is probably the most simple one we can think of. Uh, here we have the, the Earth. And we can simply assume now that the engine that uh, sends energy to the Earth, that's the sun, we have incoming radiation from, from the sun that hits the Earth's su surface. And then the Earth has a temperature and it emits radiation out to, the, at, uh, to, the, um, um, to space again. And uh, the thing we can do here is that we can assume that there is a balance between the incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation. Otherwise, temperature would increase all, of it, all, all the time or decrease all the time. But in the long run, this, these fluxes should be at least relatively balanced. And now we can set up a very simple climate model here by acknowledging some, some few facts. We know about how we can express these fluxes. For instance, the thermal radiation going out from Earth, it's proportional to the temperature of this system, to the power of four. This is a radiation law that we, that we know from physics. So this regulates the flux out from, from the Earth system. And then on the other hand we have the incoming flux here from the Sun 
which is uh, dependent on the energy uh, or the, or the uh, radiation from the sun. But then there are also some other factors coming in here representing the fact that some of the incoming radiation is not taken up by the surface but it's reflected back to space again. As some, you know, the ocean is sometimes reflecting or, or we have white ice surfaces reflecting sunlight back to, to space again. So this is something we call albedo, the albedo of the planet. Uh, and then there is a factor four here and that has to do with the geometry of this system. Uh, outgoing radiation is uh, emitted from the whole surface of the globe while this incoming radiation it hits a, a disk here and, and uh, there is a geometrical um, factor coming in here that you can uh, derive from, from, from quite simple mathematics. Uh, then we know this, the number here. We have the, the flux coming from the, sol uh, from the sun. Uh, we have the solar constant, which is approximately co constant. So this amount of energy hits a square meter at the distance of the, the average distance of Earth from the sun all the time. Uh, and then we also know that the, the albedo of, of the Earth is approximately 30%. So 30% of the incoming radiation is reflected back to space again. So we know some things here. We know that one and that one. Uh, and this now means that we can calculate this one here. The temperature of the system. Radiation. Radiative uh, temperature. And that turns out to be roughly minus 18 degrees or so. So the temperature of the Earth in balance with the incoming radiation from the Sun is roughly minus 18 degrees centigrade. Does this seem reasonable to you? No, you all shake your heads. Okay, since we live down here uh, close to the surface, uh, some here in, in, in the north where it's quite cold, but not that cold on average. And that's lucky, lucky for us. Uh, some of us live in, in warmer countries. So minus 18 degrees is not really what we see at the surface. But this is in fact very close to the uh, radiative temperature of the system. That means that what goes out into space is emitted at a slightly lower temperature. I'll try to explain that now in, in a few minutes, what, uh, how we can come to that one. Uh, I will also briefly just say that this is a climate model. It's very, very simple and it's not very useful actually. I mean, we can calculate this one number, but we cannot use it to say anything about changes. Or we can say some things about changes of the, for the entire system as an average, but we cannot really use it to say something about climate here or there or how much precipitation there is somewhere or what's the temperature of the Baltic Sea or something like that. That's, that's not what we, what we can use it for. But we can look at some, some simple physics here with this simple model. So let's look a little bit more into these different things that, that go in, into these equations here. We have the reflection again, the albedo of the system. And here's just a simple table saying something about typical albedo of different surfaces. So we note here that white surfaces like ice and snow have very high albedo. So in the high Arctic, where there is or white surfaces, you need sunglasses when the sun is up. And mo my, most of the incoming radiation is actually reflected back towards space again while darker f surfaces have much, much lower albedo, and the oceans especially here, you can see that the albedo is very, very low. So most of the solar radiation that hits the ocean, it, re it is really absorbed by the, uh, by the, sea, by the sea surface and, and, the, and the water in the oceans. If the, if the sun is very low, and the, the, so the, the sun is close to the horizon, then the, of course the albedo gets higher, and that you all know from having watched the sea at sunset, you can see the glittering from the, from the sea, etc. Uh, other things that we should, I should mention here is that clouds, they are also quite white and they also have a high albedo, a relatively high albedo, just like the ice and snow on the ground. So the global average is about, about 30% or so, including the clouds. So that's just some, some, a few things on, on the albedo. And, and that means that the incoming solar radiation will heat the surfaces differently at different places. So it's not uniform, it depends on the properties of the surface. The long wave radiation, the outgoing radiation, uh, that is something we can express again by the, the laws of physics. We have these Planck curves here, they can be uh, calculated or, or the, the, yeah, 
they derived or expressed by the, the equations and they are dependent on the wavelength. This is Vogelang wavelength uh, here in micrometers and then this is the amount of outgoing uh, radiation at for two different curves and, and and these curves they are a bit different depending on the temperature of the of the body that emits the radiation. So if you have a cold surface it emits a little bit less. This curve is down here uh, and the maximum is, is at some certain wavelength here while a warmer body up here has a much larger emission and also at a different wavelength. Uh, as you can see here the maximum are at different, different places. So this one, this curve up here is at uh, 292 Kelvin. That's almost 20 degrees. It's oh, quite close to 18 or 19 degrees plus. And this one here is at minus 70 or so. And this curve now in the middle, the wiggly one here, this is what we observe with satellites when we look at Earth in these different wavelength intervals on average as a global mean. So the satellite will experience, uh, can see these fluxes coming out from the, from the Earth. And now we can see here that here in, the, in these wavelength intervals the satellite sees something that is quite warm, you see. It's up here, close to this plus 18 degree. So here, in these wavelength intervals, the satellite can see really what's happening on the ground. So this is the outgoing thermal radiation from the, from the surface. At the, that on average for the entire globe is more like 18 degrees. And this is why you all sh sh shook your heads late, earlier on, since you know that it's warmer than just minus 18. The, the surface is warmer. So in these intervals we see something warm, but if we look here for instance in this wavelength interval we see something that is really cold, minus 70 degrees. This is what a satellite observe, observes. And then we have some chemical abbreviations here. This is CO2, carbon dioxide. And then we have water vapor, we have methane, we have um, nitrous oxide and ozone. A few very very important gases in the atmosphere. These are the so-called greenhouse gases and at different wavelength intervals they are very active gases and they uh, absorb thermal radiation. So here for instance at say yeah, six, seven, eight micrometers water vapor is very important. It absor absorbs most of, the, most of the radiation at those wavelength intervals. And then again as all black bodies as we talk about in physics they also emit radiation again. So if you have water vapor in the atmosphere at some certain height, it will absorb the radiation coming from the surface at, and then it will emit radiation again and that emission will go both downwards and upwards again. So what we really see here is something that comes from in between, not the surface that is warm and not, not the top of the atmosphere that we see here, but something that is in the atmosphere. So we have lower temperatures up in, in, the, in the atmosphere. And I said that these were called the greenhouse gases and they are, they are absorbing energy coming out of the, from the surface that increases the energy of the atmosphere and then they emit at, at different temperatures. So this is a picture really illustrating uh, what the greenhouse effect is about. Uh, these gases are quite, this is just the constituents of the atmosphere in, in terms of concentration and you know that nitrogen and oxygen are completely dominating and together with argon it's, it's almost, almost, uh, um, yeah it's 99% or, or more than that, almost 100%. Then there are some, some traces of these other elements like carbon dioxide for instance, parts per million. And if we go down to other uh, greenhouse gases, it's really even smaller. It's very, very small amounts. But even if these amounts are very, very small, they are still important. They, they are still efficient in uh, absorbing the radiation that com comes out from the Earth and also emitting it again. And in addition, we have the water vapor, which is variable and it can be of the order of a few, uh, almost a few percent at some places. So, uh, quickly again, we have two black body curves here. One at a, high, a very high temperature, this is close to the sun's surface. The sun is about 6000 degrees on its surface. And this is 255, this is close to the average that we calculated with the simple climate model I mean, a few minutes ago, minus 18 degrees or so. So Earth is radiating here and the sun is radiating here. 
And now we can look a little bit about upon what is happening here. If we look at the absorption of, of this radiation at different levels, so if we see here at, at a height of 10 kilometers or so in, in the atmosphere, if we look at radiation in this spectrum that comes from the sun, we can see that 100% of this radiation is really absorbed. We don't see that at 11 kilometers. So even when we are at that height, uh, all the, m the molecules that are above that level have already absorbed everything that comes down in these wavelength intervals. This is oxygen and ozone, and you all have heard about the ozone layer, and it's protective for this uh, ultraviolet radiation, etc. So the atmosphere is very, very efficient here in absorbing short wavelengths. But then it drops. So here, at 11 kilometers height, we see com everything coming out from the sun, basically. And if we go down to the, to the ground level, we can also see everything coming down from, from, this, from the sun. And this is quite good for us, since this is the visible uh, wavelength. So here we see everything coming in from, in from the sun. We can see all the radiation. Uh, and then if we look at the other side of the spectrum... I'm sorry about this. This is too stupid. I don't know how to cut it off. That's a good little short break from time to time. Uh, on the other side here we can see complete absorption of all uh, long wave radiation here and then there, is, there are differences here and, and we can see at the ground more is absorbed by greenhouse gases and especially water vapor is seen here in many, many places. Water vapor is found close to the surface in, in the atmosphere since it evaporates from the oceans etc. And that's where it's very efficient in absorbing much of the outgoing thermal radiation from the, from, the, from the surface. At higher levels there is not so much water vapor, but there the other gases are, are important. That can be uh, like CO2 for instance and, and these other, the other greenhouse gases. Um, I will quickly show this one saying something about the, the temperature in the, in the atmosphere now. Uh, we have the if we start from, from the top now, where the solar energy hits the atmosphere, there are some very few molecules up there, but they are efficient in absorbing the energy coming in from the, from the sun. And it's partly oxygen and some other molecules up here. So the temperature is ex extremely high, but there is almost no molecules at all. When we get down further, further down, there is a minimum in temperature. And here, in, in what is called the uh, stratosphere and also the lower mesosphere, here is where we find a lot of ozone and oxygen, and that is very efficient in, in absorbing the incoming radiation. So that's why we have a temperature maximum up here already. Uh, and then w when we get down to the surface, uh, temperatures are highest at the surface and then they drop, uh, drop with height. And this has to do then with the greenhouse gases that are found down here. So we have the highest temperatures close, close, close to the ground and temperature drops with height to somewhere uh, here called the tropopause, and then it increases due to the uh, ozone uh, layer again. This temperature profile has a very important uh, implication for, for the vertical motion of the, of the atmosphere. You know that warm air tends to uh, rise and, and cold air tends to fall down. So here, where we have warm air at the bottom and colder air aloft, this is an area where, where we, or a part of the atmosphere where vertical motion is quite... Uh, um, it's quite frequent and we see that all the time. We see a lot of vertical motion here down close to the earth. And that means that water vapor and chemical constituents and everything that we put into the atmosphere at, the, at low levels, it can be uh, mixed in, the, in this layer here in, in the troposphere. So we have a, an efficient mixing of greenhouse gases and, and different stuff here. While up here in the stratosphere, it's completely the other way around. Warmest temperatures up here, coldest temperatures down here. This is an area where uh, as warm air tends to, uh, to rise and cold air sink, there is very little vertical motion in this area. So here you don't mix things that much anymore. So this is much more stable. Most of the water vapor and everything is down here. So this is where we have the weather that we talk about mostly, clouds, precipitation. It's, it's confined to this region here. And this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time now. Um, greenhouse effect, we talked about that. Are we now introduce a simple model including the greenhouse effect. So this is slightly more complicated than, than what we saw before. Uh, now we have the atmosphere here uh, that can absorb some of the radiation uh, that comes out 
out from the ground. Um, I will not go through the, the equations or stuff to, to in, in any detail here, but we, again we have the incoming solar radiation, we have some albedo of the system, and then part of this incoming solar radiation goes through all the way down to the ground. You remember we have ozone and other things that absorb something in the atmosphere. Uh, on the long wave side we have outgoing radiation from the surface it's which, that is absorbed by the atmosphere and part, a small part of it also escapes to space directly. And then we have absorption by the atmosphere and the atmosphere itself emits radiation both downwards and upwards. And this downward uh, radi emission here is, I mean this warming of the system here is what we call the, the greenhouse effect. And so the, there is a natural greenhouse effect in the, uh, in the system that leads to the higher temperatures of the ground. And now we can see what this temperature would be in, in, the, in such a simple model. So if you just set up some equations here at the top of the atmosphere and at the ground, and then we do some mathematics here, we can just eliminate something and then we can calculate, set up a new equation similar to the other one that we had before, but with some factors here saying something about how trans, uh, how easy it is for, for radiation to uh, pass through the atmosphere, both short wave and long wave, and then put in some numbers that we have from satellite observations, uh, then all of a sudden we get something like this instead. So now the thermal uh, balance temperature at a surface would be something like 11 degrees centigrade instead, on average all, all over the globe. And this is a very simple model, but in fact it's very close to what we observed. Uh, I think it's something like almost 14 degrees or so. So this, this number is much, much, uh, in much more accordance to, to what we really observed com compared to the other one. So this kind of very simple mo model, including a one layer atmosphere with a greenhouse effect can then tell us something more about the, about the surface. I spent some time on this since the greenhouse effect is quite important and this is something that we talk a, a lot about all the time. This is what is causing much of the climate change we see. So if we change now the concentration of these trace gases, then we will change the radiative properties here and also the amount of energy stored in the system, etc. So we can now set up a global energy balance. This, these numbers here are derived from satellite observations mainly. Uh, and then we look at, on the left side here, this is the shortwave radiation from the sun. And to the right, it's the thermal radiation of the system. Um, if we have the incoming rate, and, and I should say also that, that all the numbers here are averages for the entire globe. Yearly averages, all over the day, etc. So it's, it's long-term averages. So we have incoming solar radiation. Uh, and if we look at the sphere at, at all, of, all different places, the average here is something like 342 watts per square meter. So this is what the system receives from the sun. Uh, we have the albedo of the system, it's like 30%, something like that, and that's partly clouds and partly the, gr the ground as well. So much of that is reflected directly back to space. That energy is not available for the system. But the rest here is either absorbed by the atmosphere as we have seen before, or by the ground. So about half of what's coming in is absorbed here at the ground. And that, of course, that energy heats the, the surface to a certain temperature, and then we have outgoing radiation, depending on, on this temperature. And you can see here that this number here, 390, it's much higher compared to what gets into the system. And that may sound a bit strange, but we, uh, you remember we have the atmosphere that absorbs a very large part of what is emitted, and then a huge fraction of that is radiated back towards, towards the surface again. So the atmosphere at low levels, it's quite warm, it, it uh, radiates back to Earth. And also low clouds. Think about the situation in nighttime when it's either clear, no clouds, or if there are low clouds. In the night time, if there are no clouds, temperatures can fall really very much. But if you have low clouds, there is radiation back from the clouds and temperatures will stay relatively warm close to the surface. This is this back radiation. So clouds are also very, very important here in this radiative balance. So we don't go into all of these different numbers here again. But uh, this number up here 
um, this is what we get looking at the incoming minus the outgoing here it's something like 235 watts per square meter uh, that is what is calculated here I mean th so this is the short wave part 342 coming out in and 107 reflected and then when we measure outgoing long wave it's 235 so there, there should be a balance up here in, on, on the, for the long term <coughs> If we then start looking at the surface, we can see that these numbers don't add up to each other really. So there is a net imbalance at the surface. The surface would heat over time if nothing is happening. But then we have some things going on here. So we have simply the fact that, that the surface gets warm. The air closest to the surface also warms and that it can start to uh, rise in, into the... There, so there is vertical motion going on in, in the atmosphere. So there are thermals created. and. Uh, lifting like this, like a hot air balloon. I mean, warm air is, is, is rising like that. And even more important is than evapotranspiration. So this warm surface, uh, we can have ev evaporation at the surface, either directly from water surfaces, or there are, are um, plants, etc., emitting uh, water that they pick up with their roots. So there is a lot of evapotranspiration also going on. So, so latent heat is transported from the ground into the atmosphere and then the fluxes should be uh, more or less balanced here on the, on the long term. So this is the global energy balance of the system and if we now change anything here like the content of greenhouse gases or something else in the atmosphere that either absorbs or, or reflect things here we could also change properties in clouds for some reason or if we paint all of the earth white, it we would really change the situation here, but it's a tricky thing to do, but that would change the albedo of the system and, and sh change things here as well. Uh, if we look at this on a map instead, if we just look now at the absorbed shortwave radiation, the, the radiation that uh, is ab absorbed uh, at the, close to the surface, uh, then we can see that there are huge differences between different places. Low latitudes, high numbers, a lot of radiation, solar radiation now. You know that in the tropics, of course, the sun is much higher in the, in the, in the sky. There is more radiation coming in, while at the poles, the radiation is much, much lower, of course. So that's the main pattern. But then we also can see other things here, like uh, we have less absorbed shortwave radiation here over the deserts in, in northern Africa compared to at, at, other, lati at other places on, at the similar latitudes. Anyone have an idea why it looks like this? The albedo, exactly. So that's the albedo effect. The albedo of this uh, land surface here with a lot of sand is much, much higher compared to here. So much more is absorbed here compared to there. So there are regional features here uh, that differs. So that's what's absorbed uh, in the short wave, and then we can look at the outgoing long wave radiation, and that depends on the temperature uh, of the system. And then we again see that there are large areas with high temperatures and, and uh, therefore large emissions of uh, uh, thermal radiation. This is very warm here in this area, we know that, and we know it's warm here. But we also know that it's warm here over the Amazonian basins, basin for instance, or, or over Central Africa. But here are other things that come into play. There are clouds in these regions. And these clouds are a little bit higher up in the atmosphere and therefore they are colder compared to the surface. So that's why the outgoing long wave radiation is, is, has a relative minimum here compared to the areas in, around. Otherwise again, most at the equator smaller values at the uh, closer to the poles and then we can subtract these from from each other and get the net radiation of the system so now we look at the net gain of energy uh, in different places and then we can see again tropics red areas positive numbers so in, in all of the tropical areas, low latitudes, there is a gain over time in energy. There is more incoming radiation than what goes out. At high latitudes, it's the other way around. Negative numbers. On average, energy is lost all the time. 
So this now means that in the long run temperatures will increase here all the time and decrease here all the time. But this is not the case. Or is it? No. We have a climate system with approximately the same temperatures from one year to the, to the other. There are seasonal things, etc. But there must be something happening here. Anyone has an idea what's happening? I mean, there is an imbalance here now in the radiative fluxes, but how come the temperatures are not rising here all the time? Transport. Transport, exactly, yeah. So there is transport of energy, heat, in the atmosphere and in the oceans, from low latitudes to high latitudes in both hemispheres. And this is a fundamental then for what we call the general circulation of the, of the atmosphere and, and, the, and the oceans. Um, so this is what we see. Low latitudes has a gain and high latitudes has a loss all the time and this le then leads to the uh, transport in the atmosphere and oceans. And so if we have surfaces like this, uh, we have a warm area in the tropics, we have cold areas in, in at closer to the poles and if we look at pressure surfaces in the atmosphere, this is something we meteorologists often do, we look at different pressure surfaces. Then we know that in warm air these pressure surfaces will be more apart from each other compared to in cold air. Cold air is more dense, so here these pressure surfaces are closer to each other, while warm air is less dense and they are more apart from each other. So these, if we have this kind of temperature situation, these pressure surfaces they will start to tilt with height like this, more and more over the higher up we go, get into the atmosphere. And if we look at this in a, in a horizontal perspective than sitting here, then we realize that, that this point here, if we imagine a, a small balloon or an air parcel or something there, that parcel will feel that the pressure is higher here compared to there. So there will be a pressure gradient here working, acting with a force in that direction. This pressure gradient will try to move this air parcel from here to there, as there is lower pressure there compared to here. Okay, so there is a force trying to move this air parcel. So if we have such a situation, then air should, will start to move about like that. Uh, and um, this is what we would see if we have a, this is something called differential heating and that leads then to motion. So if we have a sphere like this, and if we imagine now for a second that there is no rotation, we don't have a 24 hour day, but the planet is just still like that, uh, then we would have um, a force then from the warm areas here towards the cold areas. So at high altitudes, air would try to go this way up here, and this way down here. And then uh, there will be sinking air motion, and air going back the other way, uh, closer to the surface, otherwise there will be a constant piling up of, any, of air here, and that, that doesn't work for continuity reasons. And then there is up, uh, uplifting motion here as well. So there will be thermally direct driven uh, cells here, with, with air being transported like this. So close to the surface we will have winds like this in, in such a system, blowing towards the equator. Now the Earth is not really s uh, sitting still in space, we also have rotation. And that means that there is an additional force coming into play here, and it's called the Coriolis force, and that's uh, dependent on, on the rate of rotation of, of, of the Earth. So it's al also dependent on, on the latitude where you are, if you're at high latitudes or low latitudes. And it has the properties of, of deflecting everything in the northern hemisphere to the right, and in the southern hemisphere to the left. And that's just by the rotation of the Earth. So if you now think again of air, we have the pressure gradient force trying to move air in that direction. It will start to go in that direction. And then the Coriolis force will come into play and turn this air parcel towards you. And at some point there will be a balance between the forces and then we have a, we have a pressure gradient field like that. And we have winds blowing from inside of the whiteboard here towards you. Uh, so, winds will blow perpendicular to the temperature gradient that we see down here. And as this deflection is to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere, this means that we will have, on average, westerly winds, since air will turn in that way. So there will be westerly winds in, in, in on, the, on, the, on the planet. 
And this is what we see when we look at th there is this rotation. So the thermal s direct circulation here from the uh, tilting of these pr pressure gradients. When air gets to the north and it's accelerating, then it starts to turn right. So this means that this uh, the air will not go all the way to the pole. It will be deflected at some point. And uh, in this, there will be something called Hadley cell circulation, where we have uh, winds from the south to the north, then they are deflected, so there is westerly winds here, there will be sinking motion, and there is northward um, winds close to the surface there uh, in, in, in this area. And these winds, the surface, the, the winds close to the surface are, are called the trade winds. They are more or less constantly blow, blowing over the oceans at, at low latitudes. If we now instead quickly look at a ro the rotating Earth again, then down here, this is what it looks like actually. Instead of having at, at slow speeds or no speed, there will be this thermal circulation all, all the way. But at higher speed, like the, the Earth has, we have these Hadley cell circulations here, we have the westerlies here in these bands over the mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere and in the, in the southern hemisphere. And uh, in, in the tropics we have the Hadley cell circulation. So this is the large scale circulation of, of, of this system. There is a lot of waves also, I will get back to them in, in, a, in a second here now. But, um, Excuse me? Yes, good. Uh, what's okay. the difference between a feral cell and a Hadley cell? Uh, the Hadley cell is a thermally direct driven circulation where we have the warmest air here uh, close to the equator and we have colder air. Uh, in the in the high latitude, so uh, here we have this pressure gradient air uh, blowing in this direction. This is the name of the circulation in in the mid latitudes, where we have rather uh, a southerly wind component close to the surface, and and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, northerly wind component on uh, at higher latitudes. This is nothing you can see all the time. It's an average feature of the atmosphere, and it's uh, this is an really r rather an indirect circulation instead in, in terms of temperatures, as we have warmer temperatures in, in, in lower, lower, lower latitudes compared to the higher latitudes. Um, so the large scale circulation of the Earth is that we have trade winds, we have rising air motion close to the equator, we have sinking air motion here, and then we have westerly winds on, at higher latitudes. This is the large-scale features of, of, the, of the circulation in, in the troposphere close to the, close to the surface. And that really has a very large impact on the weather and the climate that we can observe. Um, this is a quick illustration of why there are waves in the, in the atmosphere. If you have a, this is an old experiment uh, where you have a tank, uh, where you cool something in the middle and you heat the surface out around here and this illustrates then the pole on the earth and the equator um, and then you have water in here and if you start rotating this tank as is illustrated up here uh, first of all I, I would say before that that uh, the, the water close to the middle here will then sink of course since it's cold while it will rise up, up, up uh, at the outskirts of this tank and there will be a thermal direct circulation with rising water uh, that then goes towards the pole on top here, sinking, and then along the bottom towards the equator again, much like it looks at, um, on, the, on, the, on the Earth as well. And then when you so start spinning this one, this is something you can do in the, in the laboratory, you can really um, try to, to simulate the, the, the world in, in this very simple, simple fashion. And then if you start to spinning this one at higher speed, there will be standing waves in this uh, pattern where the uh, thermal direct circulation is deflected so much, so you have this kind of westerly wind situation. Uh, and this is very much what it looks like if you look at the, at the weather map uh, starting out from the North Pole. This is now the North Pole in the middle. These are pressure surfaces uh, at some level in the middle of the troposphere. And then you can really see this wavy pattern here uh, that is a feature that comes from the temperature contrasts, the rotation of the Earth, and on top of that also uh, the distribution of continents and, and ocean, etc. So this is a very 
typical pattern that we see uh, in, the, in the climate system in the everyday weather. We have these large-scale waves called the Rossby waves. And these waves are not completely stationary, they are moving about around a little bit, uh, but they mean that as we have westerly winds here, the wind fields follow these patterns and then sometimes we have a, a northerly wind component while other times we have a southerly wind component. So here we have Scandinavia and the Baltic Sea and in this situation here on this map there is a southerly wind component. So that brings warm and moist air from the Atlantic up towards the, the Baltic. In this area here we have northerly winds instead. So this pattern is really really determining what kind of air masses we have uh, coming to our latitudes in, in the middle latitudes. I will very quickly have a, we will have a break in a, in a minute or so, so we, I think we need some, maybe some air and a uh, few minutes, but I will just see here, yeah, two more maps and then we, we have a break. So if you n now just summarize the large scale circulation and what that does to the uh, wind fields and that thereby importance to the climatological features of the of the planet. This is a map, a very old map for the month of January. It says something about winds close to the surface of the planet. And now we can see some things from these very ideal, idealized figures I showed a few minutes ago. We see here close to the equator we have north easterly winds here, here, and to some extent also here over the Pacific, and down here we have southeasterly winds and these are the so-called trade winds that's the lower part of the so-called Hadley cell circulation that brings uh, air over the oceans towards the equator from both sides these are called the trade winds uh, an important thing here is that, that air is really brought from both sides towards the equator so there is a convergence zone here it's called the intertropical convergence zone. It goes basically all ar around the, wor the world, close to the equator. So air from the northern hemisphere meets air from the southern hemisphere. And when these two air masses meet, they ha the air has to go somewhere. And if there is convergence, air cannot stay there, it, so it goes upwards. And rising air motion leads to lower temperatures, cooling of the, of the air that's, that, that is rising and thereby there are clouds and also precipitation. So this is an area where we see a lot of clouds and also a lot of precipitation. Um, we also see some other things. We have the high pressure systems here. This is the other part of the, of the so-called Hadley, Hadley cell circulation where there is sinking air motion over these high pressure cells and high pressure means that um, air close to the, s to the surface is, is really diverging instead and we have sinking air motion, there is a drying of the air and also always almost or very often very nice weather conditions, sunny situation, not so much clouds. So this is the opposite of what we see where we have convergence and, and, and uplift. So there are very different weather patterns at these areas. And then we have higher latitudes, like here in the southern hemisphere, it's very clear. We have a strong westerlies. So this is the, these are the westerlies uh, that are generated from the circulation of the, of, the, of, the, of the globe and the temperature gradient. In the north it's more difficult to see it because we have a lot of continents and oceans that, that deflect the, the flow here, but on average we also do have a westerly situation here. Then there are other things like the monsoons, etc., but I don't have that much time to go into that. But uh, this shows some of the l main features of, of, the, of the, circ the, the winds in, in the lower at atmosphere. And uh, similarly, then you can look not just for January, but for July. So there are differences here in the position of this intertropical convergence zone. The magnitude of these high pressure cells and, and the low pressure systems differ between summer and winter. Um, and that um, comes with the seasons. We have stronger cyclones in the winter, more precipitation here at our latitudes, and in summer it's, they, are, they are a bit weaker, etc. So now the final figure before the short break is uh, the global rainfall. Uh, on average, it's not really global, it's not the high highest latitudes, but uh, this very much reflects now the convergence zone that we have in the tropics, you remember, uh, where we have air from both uh, hemispheres 
converging towards the intertropical convergence zone, uh, rising air motion, and uh, very high amounts of precipitation, both in the, in the tropics, but then we also see in the mid latitudes where we have the, uh, the westerlies and the, the low pressure systems that we are used to up here in, in, in our latitudes, there is also a maximum in precipitation. And then <coughs> the minima in precipitation or in the high pressure uh, on, where, where we have the fair weather connected to the uh, sinking motion in, in the Halley cell circulation. So these are some of the main features, climatological features of, of precip global precipitation and that's completely connected to the large scale circulation of, of the atmosphere. That's what is what determines this on, on, the, on the long term. So if we want to look at, now we will go into climate models in a little while here. Climate models should be able to represent this of course and uh, we have to look into if they can do that or not. But I would suggest a short break now so we have some, uh, yeah, stand up for a while and maybe should we take five minutes or should we have ten or is five enough and then, okay, so we go on. Okay, okay so we start ended up with talking about the large-scale circulation and uh, what that does to the like climatological features. Now I will talk a little bit about uh, some of the weather systems that we are that we see both in mid-latitudes and in the, in the in the tropics and then after that I will start with the climate models. So uh, now we start with the um, just looking at different weather systems that we can see in the in the on the globe uh, that are important and uh, one of the main things that are important for us here in the mid-latitudes, these are the so-called extratropical cyclones. Here you have a sat satellite image showing uh, the west coast of the North Americas. You can see that here. Uh, and you can see a big cyclone with uh, clouds attached to that, like a big spiral here. It's a huge system. It covers more or less uh, continent. or it, it has very, very large, uh, large features, thousands of kilometers. Uh, across here. And these are connected to high wind speeds of course as you know and uh, also strong precipitation. But there are also there are mo both cloudy areas and cloud free areas that are associated with this kind of weather disturbance. Then in the tropics we also have uh, cyclones. These are the so-called tropical cyclones. They are much smaller. Here is Florida and the island of Cuba. So this feature here is very tiny compared to what we see here in these cyclones but it's much more intense. The wind speeds are much higher here. They can be like uh, three to four times or even more than that compared to what we see in an extra tropical cyclone. Finally, we do have like severe tropical con convective systems. This is something happening here. So, uh, these are convective clouds. They start as small, nice, fair weather cumulus clouds in, in, in the morning and then they can grow over time in the day and you can get very large uh, thunderstorms and uh, <coughs> rain showers con connected to them. These are some of the weather systems that are most important in terms of precipitation and thereby impacts on, on, uh, on, uh, on mankind but also on, on nature at, at the surface. So I will briefly talk a little bit about these. So we start with the middle latitude cyclones. Some of these pictures are from old Swedish textbooks so that's why there are some, some nice words here in Swedish like kall luft which is cold air and varm luft that is warm air. Um, you can neglect that but uh, there is something called a polar front uh, at higher latitudes. This is a frontal zone that uh, distinguish between the warm air in the south, on the northern hemisphere of course, closer to the equator and the colder air north of that one. It's a fairly, relatively sharp zone where temperatures fall quite rapidly from, from high, higher temperatures here to low temperatures there. Uh, and when there is air mo motion around a low pressure system that is forming on, on this uh, frontal zone here, air is moving cyclonically in this direction around the cyclone. That means that there is warm air being advected, blowing here uh, from the southwest in this, in this case. There is cold air blowing in front of the warm front here in this direction and here on the back there is cold air blowing from the north to the south. And uh, this then is called a cold front back here as if you sit down on, on earth observing this one com coming towards you. 
air will drop, uh, the temperature will drop, you will receive this cold air and, and the other way around here. Uh, there are some other things going on here, these are complex dynamical features. The warm air is uh, lighter compared to the cold air around it, so when the warm air blows up here, it's really lifted on top of the cold air that sits, in, sits close to the ground. So the warm air is ascending and rising air motion leads to cooling and thereby condensation. When it gets cold enough so you get clouds and then there could also be precipitation formed. And this grey area here indicates where there normally can be precipitation. Uh, there are also other dynamical things going on here, so, so there is an increase of kinetic energy that is movement and the wind speeds are increasing in this phase. This is an early stage of a, of a, of a formation of such a cyclone. So when it uh, gets a bit more mature there is also there will be some kind of wave on the, on the frontal system. Usually this cold air is faster and it moves, it catches up with the warm front in, in top here. So there is an amplification of this wave that you can see like this. And now uh, pressure has fallen here, so there is lower pressure, wind speeds have increased, there is more precipitation, everything is a little bit more intense in this area. And uh, you can also look here um, at the cross section, a vertical cross section along this uh, dashed line here. This is what we see down here. So from the southwest to the northeast here. You can see this, the structure of these systems very simplified. Uh, these are the frontal zones, the cold front back here, this is here, and uh, then you have the warm front in here, and you can see that these frontal zones they are tilting with height. So if you sit here on the ground uh, you look at the cumulus clouds, these con convective clouds, and then you start looking at the Sky, you can see that these clouds are approaching top at high altitudes. You can see some cirrus clouds, and they get thicker and thicker over the day. And eventually, the rain will uh, appear, like we probably will see today. The clouds are thickening today, and, and we will receive this kind of frontal precipitation sometime in the evening. That was not so nice <laughs> <laughs> to say, <laughs> but it's the, it's the weather forecast. It's, it's not. It's not my fault. But <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so this is what we can, what you can observe, such a system when it when it's moving in, in towards you, and this is, I mean, the rising air motion here. That this is what brings the clouds in in this in this region here. Uh, then you have the the warm air. There can be some some low clouds, and that depends a lot of the surface conditions, etc. And eventually the cold front will be there, and and the the cold front is moving quite quickly, as I said. So the cold air is really rushing. Uh, uh, forward here and then that means that the warm air in front of it will rapidly rise. So, so in terms in connected to warm cold fronts that can be quite massive high convective clouds that give really heavy precipitation as well. Um, yeah and then at the final stage of such a cyclone the cold front has really uh, caught up with the with the warm front uh, as you can see also here in the cross section and uh, all of the clouds are kind of centered to this area and uh, you get a very deep low pressure system uh, that can be s very strong winds at this stage and uh, the clouds and the precipitation looks something like this and this is what we see in the satellite picture I showed before you can see here the frontal system and you can see it's really spiraling in towards the center of this of this uh, air pressure uh, low pressure system with um, rising air motion and, and clouds etc. So this is an idealized figure. At this stage uh, energy has been consumed and the cloud starts to dissolve and then the, the cyclone dies out in a, in a day or so, something like that. So this is a, and, and such, this cycle it can take a couple of days. So the, often these storms, uh, cyclones are formed uh, east of the uh, North American east coast. On, there is strong temperature gradients between the continent and, and the ocean, so that there is strong frontal zone and then they uh, moves over the Atlantic towards Europe and we get these low pressure systems coming in here on the, on the east side of the Atlantic at different stages of their um, development. Uh, some precipitation associated with these cyclones, if we look again at the same picture again, 
we have then the large scale frontal precipitation in, in, in these clouds and it can we can look something like this. This is now a radar image and an uh, analysis of heavy precipitation in, in a part of western Sweden a, a year ago or something like that. That's one such occasion. You can see rather large areas with, with precipitation. Uh, this, the, the, yeah, the, the redder the colors, the more intense is the precipitation in that case. So that covers this on now for those of you don't maybe not, don't know the geography too well here, this is like yeah, 150, like oh, 300 kilometers, something like that, so like relatively fairly large areas and, and this rain band, this is at one occasion, so this is a one image looking at the precipitation with the radar, so they can be fairly uh, broad at some areas. Then there is also other precipitation associated with it and that's uh, these small triangles here, these are the convective clouds, you can see them here in the satellite picture, these small patterns, uh, and these are these big clouds and they can give very very strong precipitation at the same time. So this is the type of precipitation that you can uh, find together with these cyclones. And then you have the convective storms uh, starting out from small fair weather cumulo cloud cumulus clouds and then they can grow over day if, if the um, yeah, if the lapse rate of the atmosphere is, is, is in a good, is favorable for, for, for these clouds to grow. And when they get to this mature stage, you will have very hev heavy precipitation. You could have hail, there can be thunder and lightning associated with these clouds, and the, so they can be f fairly severe, and the precipitation can be very, very heavy as well. As well. So these are some of the weather systems and, and the, oh, that we can see in, in mid latitudes. Second now. Come back here. We go. Uh, if you look at the uh, maps of the weather, this is an old map, but it looks similar today. Um, not just today, but in today's climate as well. We can see uh, disturbances along this polar front. So here we have one, two, three different low pressure systems. Uh, one that is developing, one that's th that is. Um, more developed and one that is really at its deepest stage here. So you can see this uh, evolution of these cyclones and then you can see uh, strong winds etc. here. So this is what we, what we often see and find these uh, cyclones uh, on the polar front. Associated with them at high altitudes, not at the, at the surface, we do have the jet streams. This is a weather map, it's another situation. You, again you can see Europe here and this yellow and greenish colors indicate high wind speeds. So at high altitudes, let's say 10 kilometers or so, you have really high wind speeds connected to these uh, um, storms. On average it can be like 30 meters per second, but it can temporarily be up to maybe uh, much higher uh, wind speeds than, than that. So uh, high wind speeds in, in and, and that's associated again with the temperature contrast between warm air and, and cold air. You have these tilting pressure surfaces as I, as I talked about before, strong pressure gradients, you have uh, increased and, and really high wind speeds at, at these levels. So this is uh, the highest wind speed recorded on Earth, I think it was over Japan, uh, 150 meters per second. And you can think of what we called uh, storm conditions, wind storm conditions at surface is 25, so this is extremely high, high, high wind speeds, like 500 kilometers an hour, but that was then at some 10 kilometers height or something like that. So these are interesting things that the uh, air traffic uh, is are interested in, of course, to fly in the right direction there. And these uh, low pressure systems can give very much precipitation, especially if, the, if these large scale pressure patterns are, are fairly constant and then, then if, if this situation would be here for a few days then warm air would be uh, advected here from the south to the north and you can have precipitation over long periods of time. This is a record from uh, somewhere in, in, in Great Britain over a 20 day period, so a, few, a couple of weeks and there are some very very heavy precipitation events now. This is precipitation uh, where they had basically the same large scale feature all the time, so warm moist air from the Atlantic constantly pumping up here from the from the Atlantic, yielding large large amounts of, of precipitation in, in a certain region and you can see moisture fluxes etc. They 
sometimes talk about atmospheric rivers, rivers etc. So these features can be associated with a lot of precipitation. Uh, if we go into the tropics now instead uh, and mention the tropical cyclones, there is also um, you have the intertropical convergence zone with the convergence and then thereby the deep convection, the large uh, cumulus clouds, um, cumulonimbus clouds that yield th thunderstorms, etc. There are a lot of other things, but I don't have time for that. I will just show two figures showing, saying something about the tropical cyclones, where they form and a little bit what they look like. Um, the tropical cyclones, oh, this is too bad. They need high, a large amount of energy, which they get from the high sea surface temperatures. Why is this not working anymore? There we go. And uh, these are the regions that are favorable for their forming, uh, close to the equator. This is where sea surface temperatures are uh, high, should be 27 degrees or, or warmer. So it's not out here, it's only 20 here, but that's, that's another story. Uh, so they need high temperatures, but they also need, uh, there should be some rotation, this Coriolis force must be there, so they don't really form exactly on the equator, but on the other hand they don't form at higher latitudes at all, since then there is too much rotation and there will be a lot of wind shear with height and, and stuff like that. So they, there are some favorable latitude bands that, where they can form. And these are the areas here where, you, where we really find these cyclones. In the Atlantic, very very seldom south of the equator, there has been just a few and that depends on the temperature conditions. Uh, then in the Pacific and also in the Indian Ocean we can find them. And uh, these cyclones are formed and they can move along. They often move from the east to the west and then if they go, go to the north they can be kind of caught into the westerlies. So sometimes these cyclones they really get all the way up here but then they are more restructured in, in, uh, and look more like extra, extra tropical. Uh, cyclones. What kills these beasts at the end is with, when they hit land. Uh, there is a lot of friction from the surface, there is no more energy supply and they die out. And friction in this case means that uh, houses are torn down and, and trees are put up with their roots. This is friction, really a lot of friction since there, there are high wind speeds and, and that takes the energy out of these systems. This is what it can look like. Uh, you often have an eye like this. Uh, there is convergence of air and air is moving in towards the center in a spiral form here. And along that one there is a lot of convection ongoing, so there are huge clouds uh, formed here. That then also uh, gives very very heavy precipitation. And in the center there is down uh, downgoing air motion, air is sinking. This is why it gets dry in there and you can uh, there is often completely uh, clear uh, cloud-free conditions exactly in the, in the center. So that's uh, one other type of uh, weather disturbance that we can see, that we can find that is, has, a, has, has a very strong impact. So now I, I will turn it from, from this, these few weather patterns and, and into climate models and I go quickly back to this one again. Uh, so the rest of what I will say today will be related to climate models and climate models are models that describe the climate system. So they should describe all of the relevant processes and they should describe what we have, what I've talked about here now for, for, the, for the previous hours. These kind of weather systems, uh, all the clouds, the precipitation processes in the atmosphere, but uh, again they should also describe these other compartments in, in the climate system. And how do we do that? in our models. Um, we use numerical models where we make calculations and to do that we have to look at small, smaller parts of the atmosphere and the ocean at, at the time. So we pick out say a volume somewhere in the atmosphere and for that particular volume we can make some calculations. I will get back to that in a minute how we do that. But then this grid box here as we talk about it's not isolated of course, it needs to talk to other grid boxes here and also in the vertical of course. So we, there, there needs to be some exchange of information. So we kind of build a, a grid uh, with a lot of these grid boxes in the atmosphere 
and in the ocean. And in all of these we make one calculation of at, 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 at each time step, I will get back to that, of some uh, properties like for instance temperature in the atmosphere. We can calculate salinity conditions in the oceans uh, and temperature in the oceans as, as well of course. We can look at humidity in the atmosphere, wind speeds etc. So we calculate that those, those features. We need to have some information where to start from and then we can can make these calculations. And then all of these grid boxes they exchange information in the vertical and in the horizontal and uh, I'll get back to that in a second again how that works. So what is it that we calculate then? We look at how we can describe the atmosphere. I had some very simple climate models the, in the previous lecture and, and now this is a little bit more complicated way of describing the atmosphere, the motions in the atmosphere, what determines the uh, atmosphere. We have here things like uh, wind components in, in westerly and northern, southerly components. Um, so we say something about the winds, we have something with temperature here, this is the big T here, we have something with Q that stands for humidity etc. So we can describe these properties of the system in terms of a set of equations and these are derived from quite basic physical principles like the Newton's law, the three um, laws of motion etc. And uh, there is continu continuity equation, this is the common gas law etc. So there are some, some quite simple or fundamental equations that, that are used and here they are formulated for this system that we want to describe. And uh, a nice thing here is that many of these terms have they are formulated in such a way so that there is a time dependency. This is what it says here. So there is a this says something about change in the wind component over time. This says something about change in temperature over time, and this says something about change in humidity over time. Let's look at this one for a second. Um, if we now want to calculate this time tendency. We, see we, have, we have an equation here, says something about temperature. It says some, this term here says that temperature T, big T here, changes with time according to something that is described here. And this something is, or a few terms, and these terms, they are all related to relations between temperature temperature fields and wind fields. So there are winds and temperatures. These are also winds and temperatures, but never mind about that. Not that. We can very quickly think of a situation here when, um, oh now it's already open windows and open doors here, but we can think of a very warm room and you open a window and it's cold outside and there is a wind coming from outside into the room. Of course it will get, get colder, that's not so complicated. This is exactly what this describes here. So warm condi cold conditions, warm conditions, a wind blowing in some direction, there will be a, something that wants to change the situation in, in the classroom. This is what is described here. Uh, ah. I should try to attach this better but it's so now you can think about that for a second. Sorry. I didn't it doesn't. Hmm. So, I hope this will be better. So, that's one thing that determines the temperature if there are relations between temperature and wind, something is happening. But then there are other things as well. We have a term over here other factors influencing temperature. This is a very nice equation. It's quite simple. It's just a Q and a CP. Uh, this Q here can contain a num number of different things. It can contain the sun, for instance, when uh, solar radiation hits this room. We pull away the curtains, then we have solar radiation heating the room as well. That's one thing we can describe uh, here. We can also describe other things. We can turn on the radiators here. That will also increase the, the radiation here. So we can descri describe all the processes that influence temperature in the system. Uh, and this can be very, very complicated how that, what that looks like. But uh, if we do that, the nice thing here now is that if we know what the temperature structure is in the atmosphere at some, at some point, and we know the wind fields, we know that it looks like this right now. 
colder, warm air, the wind is like this. We know what processes that are working on the system at a certain point. In the morning the sun is coming up, we know that there will be an increase in temperature. Then we can, by knowing that, we can calculate this one over here. And this is the important part. So if we know what it looks like right now, and what processes that acts on the system, we can calculate here a time tendency. I have a question. Yes? There is uh, no diffusion term in the equation? Uh, no, it's... Uh, not not it's, it's it's basically hidden here so but that come that comes in there as well if you if, if you express it depends a little bit on on how you express this i only choose this to illustrate uh, the principles but uh, diffusion can we can put that in here also i mean a frictional dissipation and stuff like that that also goes into into this term here so it depends a little bit on how, how you how you express this this is just to to illustrate how we calculate these time tendencies and that's the important thing here since if we formulate the system and look at what it looks like at the moment then we can calculate the tendencies and by doing that we have an idea about what will what it, the situation will be in a short while into the future say in half an hour we know that the temperature will have increased by half a degree or something like that and then we can take that half a degree and the information also from the other equations what the wind fields will be in half an hour and we can add that to the state of the system and then we knew, know what it looks like half an hour into the future and then we can repeat everything again so we can co repeat into the future and, and calculate what things will look like in, in a, at a later stage so this is how we run a numerical weather prediction model which is the same or a global climate model for instance so we start with something we have to have a starting conditions for all of these different grid boxes in the atmosphere and the ocean we need to have numbers to start from and that's another story how we get to these numbers but we need to have a starting number and then we calculate the tendencies for for this three-dimensional state of temperature etc as a function then of what it looks like uh, the boundary conditions and, and other external factors as well. And then we apply these tendencies uh, to add them to get a new sta state. And then we get back here again. So we can repeat this procedure as many times as we like. So we can calculate into the future. And uh, this just illustrates that there are many different, many, many uh, calculations that needs to be done. These models that we set up are quite uh, computationally intensive so we need to have large computers to, to perform these calculations so this is exactly what we do in uh, weather prediction we start from what we know today what, what is the situation right now uh, that's very important to initialize everything to have a starting condition and then you can calculate uh, knowing about what time of the year it is where the sun is and, and uh, sea surface temperatures etc then you can run your weather forecast model to say something about what will happen later today or tomorrow or even three days in, into the future and for a climate model you can do the same thing you can keep on integrating into the future uh, for, for very long 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 terms um, the problem is that uh, I realize I don't have a good picture on that but if you start from from today uh, make calculations weather forecasts for instance then after as you don't really know exactly what it looks like today we don't have ev all information for all of these different grid boxes out there we have to have some kind of assumption so we make some errors when we start and as the processes in the atmosphere are ca quite complicated and they're also chaotic in a sense they are non-linear processes small errors in the beginning they will grow over time they will grow quite quite a lot so after a few days we, don't, we cannot say anything anymore. So weather forecasts can only be used for up to a week or maybe 10 days or something like that. That is the maximum time for which you can say that on, on this day there will be a, like a low pressure system passing by. The further into the future you go, I mean if you go to two or three weeks, then you cannot do that kind of forecast anymore. But climate models are run for hundreds of years. So we can, we can use them for very long time, time slots, but then we cannot say anything about a particular day in the future we cannot say what the weather will be like on christmas eve this year or uh, 
what will the summer of 2022 20, be, for, for instance, in Scandinavia. There is no possibility to do that. We cannot say anything that that summer will be warm or, or rainy or something like that. We cannot even give a two-week forecast that is really good, but we have some kind of limitation there. But on the other hand, this climate model, if we integrate it and we have the boundary conditions more or less correct, we have the right information about the incoming solar radiation and, and uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, this, this climate model can be used to generate uh, states of the atmosphere and the climate system that are to some extent reasonable and, and reliable. So, so they, they will produce weather. They will produce a series of, of weather events over the years that, is, uh, that should be, reflect what it could be. So, and, and then if you take statistics of these long-term uh, time series, then you, then you get to, to the repre representation of the climate, since climate is really a representation of long-term weather statistics. So these models can be used to calculate climate and represent climate, but they cannot be used to make predictions, absolute predictions on things that will happen on a certain month or a year in the, into the future or something like that. So that's different. If we look at these models now, uh, just briefly, we have uh, different models of the atmosphere that are used for different purposes. Uh, we have a uh, weather predictions models for the for the globe that are operated at grids where we have calculations grid nets of about 15 to 40 kilometers something like that apart so there we make calculations for each 15 kilometers like that in a, in a, in a grid net with vertical scales of a few hundred to 500 meters perhaps and they can be used then up to maybe 10 days or something like that we have limited area weather prediction. This is what is used at more higher re horizontal resolution, uh, but then for shorter time periods. Since if we look at the weather here over northern Europe, uh, what will happen in three or four or five days, that information is at pres currently over the Pacific somewhere. So that as air is going, as the winds are blowing uh, around, the, around the globe all the time. So they cannot they cannot be used for, for longer time periods than that, in, in, in a sensible way at least. We have also other models that looks into clouds and, and also really turbulent features, etc. They are not so much used maybe in, in, the, in, the, uh, in climate science, but uh, to some extent they are to, to investigate processes and understand things a bit better and they also to uh, affect how, how these other models are formulated. And then we do have the clim climate models and global climate models. They, they have horizontal scales in their grid nets of a few hundred kilometers, something like that. So they're quite coarse in their resolution. But then they are not used, they can then, as I explained before, be used for very long time periods. Um, this is an example from, from the European Center for, for Numerical Weather Prediction. And uh, this is a good thing since much of these models, uh, at least for the atmospheric part, it's basically the same in a numerical weather predic prediction model and a climate model. And these numerical weather prediction models, they are used every day to produce weather forecasts. And thereby they are also uh, evaluated all the time. We look at these models, how they perform, and we have an idea about their performance. And we can look at performance over time, as they have done here. They have some some measure about at a certain point when the forecast has de deteriorated and then they look at how long into the future is this point of, in time. So here we have four, five, six, seven days, etc. So here in the beginning of the 80s, a forecast uh, that had some kind of quality at day five or six into the future. When we get to approximately 2010 here, we see the same, the quality has increased a lot, so we can now make forecasts that go longer into the future, a couple of days. And that is partly due to that the models have become better, but also that as we have better observations. So we constantly work with these models, try to uh, evaluate how, the, how they perform and also understand how they, how they can, uh, they, well, what we can expect from them, simply stated. And uh, as, they, as these are also going into the formulations of the climate models, they we have some kind of confidence in, in these models, at least to some extent. Yes, good. 
Oh, please. Good. Yeah, I guess as a mature page, you can look and see that there are 10 days forecast. Yes. Mm -hmm. According to your curve, there's not much skill. Uh, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, this is, this is one measure of, of uh, at a certain point where the skill has, has decreased. But I, that's, I mean, so this is just to compare over time how, where that point in time is. But uh, it doesn't say that the forecast is completely lousy after that, but uh, it deteriorates quite quickly. And I think 10 days is really, really on the limit. So this is, um, yeah, we have to get back home, Marcus, and talk to our friends. <laughs> No, but I think that, I mean, 10 day forecasts are issued, but, uh, but also it, there it depends very much on how, what you say. You, you can, I mean, it doesn't make sense to say that the temperature here at the Aske will be like 12.2 uh, degrees on this day, 10 days into the future. That's completely, that doesn't make sense at all. So, so if we have, I mean, these uh, telephones with applications and you can have exact numbers, it's... Uh, throw it away it doesn't work not not on those time scales it's okay for maybe a few hours or the first day or so but the further into the future you go you need to think about what as a metrologist as a forecaster I, I would really think very carefully about what to present we could talk about forecast for the next few hours I can be quite detailed but if I would say something about tomorrow I will be less detailed if I should say something about next week then I could possibly say something that uh, um, large-scale circulation, I mean, we, lo we looked at these pressure patterns before, says that likely be southwesterly winds in, in ne the next week, mild conditions, but I cannot say anything about clouds on a certain day or anything. So that also, the information is there, but you need to interpret it in a good way. But um, yeah, we have these constant discussions about this back at SMHR, what you can, what you can do and what you cannot do about presentation. Yeah, yes. Minus mm. whatever, then it would be much easier to understand. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And this is something you, uh, it's, it can be difficult to estimate the errors, but uh, you can try to do it. And we have, um, there are some methods f for looking into that. Uh, and uh, I, I will not go too much in, into weather forecasting now, but, but what is done is that um, when, you, when you run uh, this global uh, numerical weather prediction model at, at the European Centre, they, they don't run it only once, they, they run it 50 times all the time. So they, so they, they start from, from some initial state and then they make some disturbances here and there. They change things a little bit as we, we know that the observations we have, they are not exactly correct all the time. So they make 50 different initial states and then they run this, so they ha don't have one forecast, but they have 50 ones like this. And then you can look at day 10, and then you can look at this un entire ensemble, and then you can say something, okay, well, it looks like, uh, looks like something like this, or maybe we have two solu solutions, a lot of numbers up here and there, and then you can say something about uncertainties, and, and uh, as a forecaster, that information is very, very valuable. The problem can be to, to um, formulate that and, and to, to get that out in, into the, uh, I mean, like the common public or, or, or to some specific customers, etc. So, so these are things that we are, we are, those working on that are, are working with that kind of, so, so errors are interesting. But then, of course, you can also, you should have ideas about errors in the model, etc. And, and that's, it's not so easy to determine these errors, really. But, um, yeah. Sure, but it's a, it's a good point. I was showing this only to say that we try to verify and, and evaluate our model tools all the time. So this is, this is an important thing. Uh, there are some limitations of these models, of course. We have our grid boxes here. Uh, they are quite coarse. You saw the scales a minute ago or so. We cannot describe everything with just one number for temperature in a grid box that is 100 by 100 kilometers and 500 meters in, in, in vertical. There is just one number for temperature, humidity, etc. And we cannot describe such a cloud in, in that one. Or the microphysical processes, condensation, we have cloud droplets of this size, you cannot describe them explicitly. We have to do something, we have to do some tricks. And that means we do something called parameterization, where we try to express these small scale phenomena or features with the large scales that we know from, from the model. 
And that's maybe the, one of the really main problems with all of these different models. These are highly simplified things. Uh, even if they are complex, they are still simplified and, and we don't know everything. And, and also these models are then also, as I written down here, compromises between details then in the physical description and the computational speed. If you want to run such a model of all over the globe with very high resolution, it's extremely expensive, so that also takes a lot of time. It's close to 12.30, I will maybe show one or two figures extra and then we go for lunch so we can think about this over lunch. Um, so these are the limitations. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, these are the space, space, spatial and temporal scales that we work with, in the, like in the atmosphere. This goes from centimeters to meters to kilometers to basically all planetary scales over here. And these are the temporal scales going from um, seconds to uh, days and, uh, and years up here. And, and then we have even smaller scales down here. Uh, and then we can see here where are the different features that we want to simulate with our models. We have planetary waves, we have the cyclones, the ex extra tropical cyclones we, I talked about before. Uh, we have the convective, uh, the, the big uh, convective clouds with precipitation, thunderstorms, etc. Small cumulus clouds. And then we get into turbulent processes and at even smaller scales we have like the microphysics of the clouds, etc. And all of these scales, we need to describe that in this 100 by 100 kilometer grid box uh, and, and we make calculations maybe once every half an hour or something like that but still we need to describe everything there and of course that doesn't really work so we have a lot of things that we need to parameterize clouds radiation processes uh, chemistry uh, turbulent fluxes of different kinds etc and all of this needs to be described in some way I will give two or three examples of, of such parameterizations before we go to lunch now how should we represent the cloud in such a model this is a, a map over central Europe you have Italy here UK over here and these are grid boxes now every green dot here represents a 40 kilometer grid this is fairly high resolution if you take it on the global scale. Quite many bo points you need to make calculations in. Uh, such a model can have a vertical structure looking like this with maybe 60 levels in the vertical going from the surface. Quite many s layers down here, a little bit less up here and they go all the way up to say 80 kilometers or something like that. High, high altitudes. How should we describe now our little nice cumulus cloud in, in this model? This, this cloud might have a horizontal ex um, uh, extent of say one kilometer here even smaller sometimes and it might be everything from 100 meters to five kilometers in, in height here so we need to somehow describe that in these grids and that's uh, it's a very tricky thing and you know that the clouds have a very very important uh, implications on, 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 on everything like the temperature if you sit on the surface it's sunny or and there is a cloud the temperature will drop immediately and all of these things you need to somehow describe. And, th and that is done in these so-called parameterizations. And I will not have time to go into any of these details, but uh, here is another thing uh, along the same lines. Um, here are two cases now. These are real clouds. One cloud here and one small cloud sitting up here. So this is what we can see in, in a typical grid box somewhere. And this is another situation where there is a cloud layer covering all of the sky up here and then the same cloud is down here. So these are, if you look at the total extent, so here the clouds cover maybe 40% of this grid box and here they cover 100%. Now if we get to our climate model, it looks like this. We have a number of uh, grid boxes on top of each other. We have clouds that are, are, they don't look very nice like this, they are kind of just a fraction of the box. But how should we distribute these clouds? Should we put them on top of each other like this? So we have one cloud here, makes sense. This is the cloud here. And then there's another one here. So we can have like a maximum overlap that will give a very, very small fraction of clouds. 
Uh, on the other hand, we can have a minimum overlap, so we really spread them out on all of the grid box. We have a large cloud cover in that case. Or we can do combinations of this one here. So maybe like here, we connect these two. We think that, okay, these are probably the same cloud, and then there is another one up here somewhere. So we have to do tricks like this. And depending on, on which trick we use here, the results will be very, very different. And these are the things that we are all, all the time playing around with with these models. So these are quite interesting things. And the clouds are not very nice <laughs> if you look at them. Um, okay. Think also about this. I will not talk about this. Uh, condensation, formation of cloud droplets. These are even smaller scales. I mean, now we are to microphysics. These are micrometer scale. And we still need to describe this in, in our models somehow. And these microphysics things, they generate features like this in the atmosphere. This is a satellite picture showing low clouds uh, off the coast of France here and Spain. And then there have been ships going down here in the close on, on the surface emitting particles into the atmosphere. These particles, they interact with the clouds so that the reflectance, the albedo of these clouds is, ch is changing due to these particles. These are things that we need to really some to some, to some extent also handle in our models if we want to do something really clever about climate. This is not included in all climate models or in weather prediction models. But, and these things are really happening on the microphysics scales. I think we break here for, for lunch so we can bring this and then we get back to after lunch we will talk about how good are these models or how bad are they and then I will go into the regional climate models so we st stop with that. Okay, so now I have the tough task of uh, talking after lunch. This is the worst time of the day, so I hope you all had a nice relaxing lunch. I did go for some swim, so I hope I will not fall asleep. But if I do, please wake me up. And <laughs> no, sorry. Um, in the rest of the day, I will talk about uh, a little bit about model evaluation and uh, other processes that are needed in this model, apart from the pure, maybe meteorological stuff and then uh, evaluation of, the, of these models. And then we will get into the regional climate models, why we use them and what they are, etc. And at the end, I will briefly show some results from, from these regional climate models, for mainly for Europe. And uh, again, please interrupt whenever you have any questions. Or, and, and also, I can say that I will also be here uh, in the evening if there are more questions in the, in then. So, so you know. Okay? This one I showed in the before lunch. So the limitations of all of these models are a few. Particularly this part here with what I call parameterizations when we try to explain or express small things, small scale features with the large scale parameters that we have available in the model. And that can be single clouds. These are still small scale compared to most models. But it can also be even smaller things like cloud droplets radiative processes interacting with particles in the atmosphere etc. That's a very big challenge. The other thing is that uh, we ha always try to compromise then between computational power and uh, enough detail. We want to add as much detail as we can in, in the models. So these are the things that we are kind of always restricted by uh, in both weather prediction models and, and global climate models and oceanographic ocean agro Oce sorry, <laughs> oceanographic models as well, sorry. Um, if we want to evaluate these models, atmosphere, ocean, global climate models, uh, we can do different things. And this is, a, the picture here is a few years old, but uh, it looks similar today, I would say. Uh, here it is shown observations of global mean precipitation. This is the field, from, it's derived from satellites and also some surface-based measurements. And here is a model that has, sim cl a climate model that has been run for a long time and then we plot the same field here. So this is also annual mean precipitation. And then you can start look at them and they say, okay, this looks quite nice. You see the red colors are in about the same place. You can see the intertropical convergence zone, both in the model and in the measurements, and you can see the subtropical regions, they are indeed dry also in the models, as they should be, so that's, that seems to be quite okay on the large, large scales. 
down here you can see differences and, and then you start to see things here that are not so good maybe that the model um, in this case underestimates precipitation in the tropics and overestimates it on, on the on the borders of that etc so these kind of things is what we as climate models work a lot with try to evaluate these models we try to compare them to observations whatever observations we have it's not just precipitation it's also all other variables we look at seasonal features changes etc and try to understand why they differ uh, and if we can understand that and then we try to improve the model so we get closer to the to the observations so this is what we all do um, and the weaknesses I've already discussed that the res resolution is fairly coarse in global climate models so we don't really resolve all scales also if we want to look at the climate system we don't include all of the processes that we may need to look at climate change over lo long time scales for instance uh, there is a feedback from the carbon cycle when it when the climate gets warmer in the future there will be different possibilities of the ocean to take up uh, carbon and also by the vegetation on, on land total amount of carbon stored in that can also change over time that will have impacts and feedbacks changing the atmospheric um, amount of carbon dioxide again and then increase or decrease the greenhouse effect etc and also we don't understand everything of course so a model is just a model it's our best knowledge and, and possibility to formulate things so we don't understand everything but by and large we can models can reproduce much of the large scale features means but also some more extremes and variability etc and this is what they are designed to do um, another thing here is that the observational data is not always that good we have problems we have huge problems in in having good data to compare model output with uh, climate models climate time scales are long we want to compare and see what what's happening over long time scales we want to say something about climate change people talk about pre-industrial times there are no measurements whatsoever of climate in pre-industrial times if you start before 1750 maybe one or two series of temperature measurements in the world dating back before that that's not so much so we basically we don't know we don't have any measurements we have reconstructions and other means to to say something about climate post in the past times but we have very little observations here is are some maps with surface based measurements in in uh, i think it's the crew data set yeah it's from the climate research unit in england they collect information so this is where there is some information temperature information this is now close to the surface two meter level 1870s you can see most areas no observations at all europe is covered north america to some extent the u.s i would say also some areas where there are a lot of ships going around on the oceans otherwise the continents have no measurements at all basically in the mid 20th century we do have observations in some quite large areas but still there are many white areas on the globe also over the continents this is not so far back in time actually and even here at, at the year 2000 actually there are still white spots on these maps so measurements of temperature that is measured at quite many places is not there if you want to have other I mean to balance a climate model you need to have input about precipitation and evaporation how much water vapor is evaporated from the surface there are no measurements of that more or less at all actually anywhere evaporation this is something we indirectly can calculate based on temperature but we don't we don't have measurements of that so this is a big issue also when we try to evaluate these models uh, things have of course improved over time especially when we get here these are now surface based observations but then there are other things like radio sons these are the balloons that we meteorologists send up in the air to collect information about what's up there so these are in situ me measurements but then the remote sensing data or the is the big thing that happened here in the end of the 20th century so global coverage of many of these properties uh, the problem here is that the time series are still relatively limited but we do have more data now to to use to evaluate our models with 
Another thing that we are working with is combined products, combining weather prediction models and observations. These model systems are run every day. We try to put in all observations that are available and to get a better analysis of the current situation. And together with a model that fills up then the rest of the, of the volume and everything, we have fairly good products here, but they are not pure observations. But that's probably the best picture we can get of the atmosphere for the last couple of decades. And there are also now, I think, reanalysis products also for the, for the oceans as well. Isn't it so, Marcus? There are some, some yeah. Mm. Okay, so this is what we have to deal with when we try to evaluate our, our models. Another thing here is that if you look at the observations, that there are a lot of issues with them, even single observations. This is a satellite picture of, of part of Stockholm. This is central downtown Stockholm, the old town. Uh, and uh, I think this is something like, uh, could be 10 by 10 kilometers, something of that order. Uh, there are a lot of spatial inhomogeneities in such an area. In Stockholm is one place where we do have a long time series. There is a observational site here, the observatory in Stockholm, where they have measured temperature back to from 1756. So it's uh, one of the longest series there are, there are actually. Um, so that's good for the, for the record here. We know something about changes over time. But if you start thinking about it, when they established this in 1756, this was outside of the city. This was in the countryside. There were cows eating grass in this area. Now this is mid downtown Stockholm. So there have been changes over time that you have to think about. Um, so there are inhomogeneities like that. Um, and also, yeah, of course, changes in measurements, etc. And then uh, if you now have a, a climate model with its scales, the scales that are quite large, as I talked about before, if you have a 10 by 10 kilometer grid side here that you want to say something about, then you have land areas, cities, forest, rural, rural areas, you have ocean, this is uh, the black ones here, this is the Baltic Sea, within such a grid box and you have one measurement here, it's what is it representative of really? And what is the model producing? The model is producing an average over this, but we are measuring something there. So that's not always so easy to compare. So maybe the model is producing something which is not very similar to this thing here, but it may still be quite a good result since it's an average for uh, something else. So you have to think about representativity also when you compare observations to model output. Okay, uh, of course climate is changing. I think you talked a little bit about that yesterday. I will not talk too much about that now. This is the global mean temperatures, etc. And um, one thing we can use, we can look at climate models and use them to try to simulate this change over time. Uh, then you have to think about things like changing what changes the situation, changes in radiative forcing. This is an older picture, it's not the most new one, but you have the greenhouse gases here. Uh, red one colors are increasing the amount of energy in the system. So there is a positive so-called radiative forcing of the system. We are increasing the greenhouse effect, it leads to warmer temperatures. Uh, there are other things uh, with aerosols, for instance, that leads to a a cooling in some places and uh, and also on the, on the global mean but uh, all in all there is a positive radiative forcing uh, increasing temperatures of the systems if you prescribe this to a model you can tell the model if you simulate this time period here you can you can you can explain how co2 has increased over time in the atmosphere and then you can uh, let the model simulate the climate over the 20th century to see what, what's happening. Uh, here are the changing concentrations as measured, etc., from, from different. This is CO2 and this is methane over there. Uh, if you now do this in, in models, um, excuse me for the old picture here, but it, it, it just illustrates the, the case here. So results are quite similar also with today's models. If you if you use a model uh, and, and don't prescribe these changes in CO2, you just use pre-industrial CO2 concentrations, then you can get something like the grey thing here. There is a lot of variability. It's a bit warmer and colder in different years, as it is in the climate system. There is a lot of variability. The observations show something like this. We have this very strong increase in temperature over the last decades. Um, 
if you add now to the, if you just look at the anthropogenic part here yeah, and the increasing CO2 concentrations, you get something like this in the model that is also has this uh, increase here in the late, latest few decades. And if you add together both changes in natural and anthropogenic forcing factors, you can get a, you, you get a better match in these models since they they represent they represent this situation represents what has happened in the climate system in, in a better way. So this is also one way of kind of trying to evaluate these models, how they respond to changing forcing conditions to see how they react and what, uh, what the changes are over time. Um, so we look back in time to see how these models represent past conditions and past changes that we have some kind of measurements or other estimates about. Uh, the systems in, in these models that we are including there this illustrates that over the years when we are working with these models we include more and more processes you can see here starting out from only the atmosphere we add land surface ocean sea ice aerosols sulfate aerosols we add other aerosols the carbon cycle vegetation we add more and more components to the system since we think that these are important for for climate and for climate change on long time scales uh, so these are have been formulated and then added to these models so these models are now uh, more full so-called earth system models uh, that includes a lot of different processes that are that are of, are, are of importance uh, but all of these processes and process models are not evaluated the same way as the weather forecast models I mean the atmosphere land interaction here is very well val evaluated on a daily basis in, in most of these weather prediction models but that is not the case for these other some of these other parts of the of the climate system but yet they are important for the long long term changes. Um, then there are interaction between different processes and things. I mean, you have the pure physical, microphysical cloud physics in the sky. You have convective clouds connected to strong updrafts. There are winds. There is uplift of, of air here. So anything that is down here in the in the so-called boundary layer close to the close to the surface it could be water vapor but it could also be other things like air pollution different gases and aerosols and stuff that those particles and gases are brought up by the winds in these clouds uh, lifted and they can then be exported on, on other levels so this these kind of clouds interact with gases, trace gases and atmospheric chemistry etc. And then there are processes combining both microphysics and, and atmospheric chemistry within clouds and clouds can also then have an effect of um, to rain out some of these gases then gets uh, captured in the rain droplets and then get deposited on the ground at the end. So there are many strong interactions here of different processes that need to be um, explained in these models. and. For these kind of processes, there are also again talking about measurements and, and uh, uh, evaluating models. There are no continuous measurements of aerosol concentrations, especially in the atmosphere. So then one has one is more limited and has to look into field campaigns and short short term measurements, etc., to try to understand the processes and evaluate models for for that. Now that's some interaction between different processes. I showed this already before with the ship tracks there, uh, changing cloud properties from, from air pollution. Um, these are aerosols, yeah, that's also a very important part that needs to be described in the models uh, with particles on very many different scales here ranging from very small particles to large particles and they interact with radiation and with clouds and um, also with actually electricity also to bring out ions and have impacts on thunder etc. Uh, then there are other things like the biogeochemical cycles you know about the, that this is uh, a sketch of the sulfur cycle involving um, the atmosphere and some some other parts as well both the oceans and land etc and there are both both anthropogenic and, and natural sources to different sulfur com compounds into the atmosphere that is then uh, converse, um, um, there are then chemical reactions converting this into sulfate for instance that could be rained out with the precipitation etc and the, all of these different processes are things that you might need to 
including the models if you're interested in, 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 in their contribution to the climate, climate system. These sulfate aerosol uh, con contributes to sulfate aerosols, small particles that can change cloud properties as we saw on this one here. Probably to a large extent uh, sulfate aerosols that are made may or produced within the atmosphere from, from this chip exhaust. Okay, so there are many of these different processes that need to be included. I can also show this one just to say that, I mean, if you introduce um, trace gases or, or chemical constituents into a climate model that has description of winds, etc., then uh, in this case you can look at how a gas like CO2, carbon dioxide, is dispersed all over the globe. These are now two figures showing CO2 at one moment in this is a, a January picture, and this is a July picture. And in January we do have um, emissions in the north here and we also have, uh, we have respiration from, from the vegetation and we have anthropogenic emissions. So there are high concentrations up here. Higher in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere. This is where the emissions take place mostly. And you can see patterns here also to some extent following weather situations etc. And uh, there could be plumes like this that could maybe possibly be related to burning of uh, biomass, for instance. I guess, I don't know, but it could be. Uh, half a year later, we can see that these high concentrations up here, uh, that kind of air is now seen down here. So concentrations in these areas have increased. So air from the north with high CO2 concentrations have started to uh, be dispersed towards the south. At the same time, there are negative or, or uh, not negative, but lower concentrations up here, and that's due to uptake by growing vegetation. So there is a strong seasonal cycle to to CO2, and that's also seen here. And if you would have looked at next year, you would have seen higher concentrations whatsoever. But there is a seasonal cycle, etc. And that's of course, I mean, a, a model climate modeling, including all the winds and that can can. Uh, can show, uh, you, you can use that to look also into other constituents like CO2 for instance, if you like. So that's just very short to say something that these models, they, they need not, they need to include also other things than uh, not, not just uh, metrology and the metrological processes. Okay, uh, that's about the climate models. Uh, now I will go into the regional models. So now we go to more towards the, towards the smaller, smaller scales then. Um, so basically I will, I will continue to talk about models, but now I will try to introduce here the concept of, of the regional models. So there are some problems with these global climate models. I've already indicated that they don't resolve everything. This is now uh, an example from, uh, from, uh, from our region here, up here in the north, uh, showing precipitation in uh, winter. Mm -hmm. And to the left uh, this is actually a reanalysis. It's not real observations, but it's uh, fairly close to observations, I would say. And there are some features to that with high, uh, the highest amount of precipitation here in the on the west coast of Norway. We see higher amounts in western Sweden compared to eastern, etc. And this is what we also see in, in if we look at the observations on the gr on ground, for instance. If we have a coarse scale global climate models operated at say a 200 kilometer grid, that's really 20, 200 kilometer by 200 kilometer grid boxes. This is quite, quite coarse. Such a model would generate something like this. Very weak gradients as you can see here, compared to what, what is seen here. Here are strong gradients. Uh, so the pattern is different. Maybe the total amount in the area is reasonable, but there are some problems. And if you want to say something more specifically about differences here on, on a regional detail level, you cannot really use this information to a good extent. And that has to do then with the fact that this global climate model, it doesn't resolve the land sea surface contrast in a good way, and it does not really resolve, the, for instance, the height of the, of the mountain chain here in, in a good way as well. And if we look here at this one again, uh, so say a few hundred kilometers, this is hundred kilometers here. So a global climate model, it, I mean, it only resolves things up here, including the planetary waves and maybe 
maybe the extratropical cyclones, but every anything that is smaller than that is not really resolved. Ah, there it is, okay. Um, another problem with these models then, that is also related to, yeah, that is related to, to this thing here, that it doesn't resolve the, the small scale features, is that if you look at, this is statistics from different atmospheric models at different horizontal resolution, 80 kilometer, 125, 200, this is the size of the grid in these models. And this one here says something about a number of years and a simple measure, the number of cyclones simulated by the models at different uh, in the middle latitudes. So if you have a core scale model, you're down here somewhere. If you increase the resolution, the number of these cyclones increases and it, here at this kind of resolution, you get very close to the reanalysis th and this is very close to the observation. So if you increase the observation or the resolution, you have a better possibility for these models to really to simulate the features that we are interested in. And the, the mid latitude extratropical cyclones, these are the low pressure systems that comes here all the time and, and gives us the precipitation. So if you have a climate model producing only this, a little bit more than half of, of the precipitation compared to that one, maybe not the amount, but the number of, of uh, cyclones. It's, it's not a very good model, actually, if you only see half the number of weather disturbances uh, that we observe. So this one is, in that sense, much better. So this is something you can gain by increasing the resolution. So, okay, then it's easy to say, then, okay, let's run all our models at this high resolution. But then we have the problem of the computational cost again. I was referring a little bit to that before. So the idea here is that you, yeah, these are, okay, so these are some two generation of global climate models used in the previous IPCC report and this is the last IPCC report. So you can see the global climate models that we are referring to today in the last IPCC report, they are, I mean, they are still not uh, perfect in, in, in some senses. So there are still things to do with these models as well. So in, instead we introduced the concept of regional climate modeling. Instead of running the models for all the globe, we focus on an area uh, and in that area we apply higher resolution to do something more about the uh, details in that area. But as the atmosphere and, and everything is continuous, we need to have some information about what's coming here on the, on the boundary. And that is something we take from the global climate model and say that this is a global climate model operated at this uh, resolution and then we can run at much higher resolution in, in, the, in, the, in the small scale instead. This is now 50 kilometer grid and this is something like two or 300, something like that. So a good increase in, in the resolution. You can see the map, you realize that, okay, so we are here somewhere. You cannot see that from that one. And that also means that it's not just the land sea contrasts and the mountain chains. It's also the processes as I talked about before. You start being able to resolve things like cyclones, etc. if you go to the, uh, to the higher resolution. So now uh, again the same two pictures on top as we saw before. But down here we have now downscaled everything as we say. So we take information from, from this model here, the reanalysis in this case. We run it through a regional model at higher resolution. And the same thing here, we take information from the very core scale global climate model. We downscale it to higher resolution with the, with the regional model. And what, what I mean with that downscaling is that simply in, at, at each and every time step of the model integration, we take information here, here, here and here. We have information about the winds from the global climate model, what is, what is coming in here over this boundary what is coming in here, what's going out there. That kind of information is fed into the regional model where we have higher resolution and calculate everything at, uh, in, 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 in that sense in more detail. Otherwise it's kind of the same equations, that's not different. It doesn't differ too much. There are some, might be some formulation differences, but no fundamental things. Eric? Yes, good. Yeah. May you play, uh, please explain this figure that you have from the real why are the strange distribution of data spatially? Can you explain that? I mean, that's not the model domain, what you show here. 
Aha, uh -huh. you mean why it looks like this over here? Yeah. Uh, that's the distribution of the available observations. But uh, this is this is I think this is the model domain that was used for these simulations yeah. for the for the regional climate model. So that's why it's the same over here, and then it's only the land land based areas that we have picked out, and uh, the plot is uh, extremely old, so it's quite ugly. I'm have to apologize for that, but it's um, no problem. But I mean. Uh, that's but true. Data there or uh, it's, <coughs> it's true. Was the white sea? Well, uh, as yeah. you said, it's, uh, sea areas is included except the body sea. Yeah, I see. Um, so it's uh, no, it's uh, it's a bit strange. I agree. Uh, I don't I don't remember actually. I have to rewind twelve years and think about how I did that. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Why is this spatial distribution? Yeah, you're right. Oh, it's a bad example. I have to think about that. Maybe after a beer or two tonight I can <laughs> help you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. So that... Um, okay, apart from that now <laughs> with the White Sea. Uh, the thing is that, as we saw, that, that the adding this higher resolution can add details that get things more realistic at, at those scales, at least. Um, so these are typical errors in such models. Uh, I just show uh, briefly a few few of these maps here, showing uh, this is now uh, biases errors in uh, in uh, mean sea level pressure here. Too high pressure, too low pressure. Errors are quite small. So if we if we take this kind of Reanalysis, observations, good data at the, at the boundaries, these models, they can reproduce the climate in a, in a fairly good way. If we have good information coming in from the boundaries, the models can also reproduce things in a, in a fairly good way. And that is what this sh view graph shows here. Uh, these are now for some small areas. We can look at instead uh, distributions here. These are probability distributions. These are this is pressure and these are frequency distributions and we can see that by and large the model reproduces the kind of frequency of low and high pressures etc. And there are deviations, you can see that as, as well, but these are, these are the things that we are looking more into and try to, try to explain them. So what I want to say with this one is that given good, good boundary conditions, the large scale circulation in such a model can be represented in a good way. That means that we have low pressure systems, high pressure systems in about the right place, in about the right uh, amplitude. Uh, and that is what really governs the, the, the weather and the in, on, on the regional scale. Uh, and then we can also look at other variables like near surface temperature from the same simulation again, also with the reanalysis on the boundaries. When we have these good large scale circulation statistics, we can see that the biases in temperatures are to a large extent in the white area here, meaning that biases are quite small of the order of a, de a degree or something like that. But then we also have areas where we have, in this case, identified problems. It's too warm up here, it's too cold down here. And then we try to understand what is it that makes this model not perform perfect here. Try to understand it and it's often related to clouds and, and radiative processes and then we try to look into our formulations and see if we can if if we can improve things again and this yes good oh Sorry, thank you generally easier to model summer conditions than winter conditions because you mentioned the error uh, no it's it's not generally easier this it happens to be quite good in in this case here but but you can also have bad situations in, in, in summer as well. Problems here are, I mean, there are strong f strong feedback processes here involving snow cover on the ground uh, that can complicate things, snow cover together with, cl with clouds. And uh, as the atmosphere is very sensitive to what's on the ground and how what that looks like, then you can, you can easily have large errors in, in temperature, for instance. But it's, it's not generally worse in winter compared to summer. It depends a little bit on what you look like, but I, I wouldn't say that. So these are the kind of exercises that me and my colleagues work with. We try to evaluate these models and try to improve them all the time and, and see if we can have them make, make sense somehow. 
There are some other examples here I don't. Another thing we look into is uh, the regional scale. This is now the Baltic Sea runoff, the, the catchment area. So everything, all precipitation that falls in this area eventually runs with the rivers towards the Baltic Sea if it's not evaporated. So uh, then we can look at that area and try to see how much precipitation there is. And this is done here in the previous model. The, the, and this is now the red one. So you can see seasonal cycles here. We have most precipitation in summer, as you know. Uh, and the, the red one is the model and then the blue one is one set of observations and we can see that again given good boundary conditions we can reproduce the seasonal cycle and we can also to some extent reproduce years that are, are wet and years that are a bit drier etc. So that, that, that kind of information is what these models can, can provide on these scales. So that's a relatively good message I think. Uh, again, we have to acknowledge the fact that, that these observations are, of course, highly uncertain. So we don't know if they are exactly correct or not, or if they are give the very best estimate of, of precipitation in this area. But this is what we have to, to live with. This is another, yeah, this is exactly that. We, we looked at that at, in another study, actually, where we, we looked at exactly the same region and we looked at three different um, three different observational data sets and, and these are now differences in precipitation over the months between uh, uh, between reanalysis data and three different data sets so this is not not the model at all it's just three data sets and you can see precipitation difference by <coughs> some 20 30 percent something like that for for some months between different data sets uh, so okay. so same for the same region yes so these are different estimates of the precipitation in the area based on different sources. You have collected data from different weather services, etc., in different ways and, and made different corrections. So, and this is a, an area where we have a lot of observations, actually. This is a good area. We have, I mean, if you look at Central Africa, we don't have anything, basically. And um, so we, the data situation is often, uh, often quite tricky. This is for precipitation where there are observations. We also, if we want to look at the, say, the water budget here in this area, say something about the total fluxes, we need to say something about evaporation. And then we did, did also some, some other comparisons here. Now, now we have the model included here. Uh, this is both, um, how is it now? Both evaporation and I think it's, it's runoff also, the, the, the water, but, uh, yeah, the, the runoff at the surface as well. But now we don't have any observations at all, at least not for, for the evaporation. So we compare different models to each other. So the situation is, it's, it's a bit tricky to do these um, estimates in a good way. And then we talk about biases in this, these models and we need to uh, correct for them if we want to do hydrolo hydrological calculations. But uh, often I think the uncertainties on the observation side are quite large, large actually. Yes. For instance, do you think that uh, like the the decade of eighties or nineties has worse data than recently? Uh, would you think that mm, if you would yeah. exclude then to some extent I think the, it's I think it's both ways. In in some places the number of observations have decreased over time in some, <coughs> some places it has increased so the, the number of is changing over time and I think maximum number of precipitation observations have was probably sometime in the maybe 90s I guess surface-based rain gauges I, I don't recall exactly now but uh, so there, there might be changes like that but on the other hand I mean we have different techniques in sampling and and also for correcting so but I, if you go back like in the 60s or 50s, then information is worse, definitely. That's not a very precise answer, but uh, <laughs> I know that. Uh, what, we, what we like these regional climate models to do is to really improve regional features. And he, this is one example where we had a big project where we ran like 12 different regional climate models for Europe. And then 
we tried to, they, the, the authors here, they tried to filter out all the large scale information that is kind of given by the, by the global model. So they just looked at the, at the details, the small scale de details. And uh, this is now again precipitation, this is from observations. Um, this is millimeters per day, that's why the units are a bit strange maybe. So we have most, most precip here in the, in the north and also down here on the, um, to the east of the Adriatic Sea and, and also in, in the west of the British Isles, etc. Th these are the areas where we have most precipitation in Europe. And now we have filtered out all the large scale features from the, from the low pressure systems. This is very much f driven by the orography, the mountains the placement on the mountains in combination with the main winds of course and this is now what the models produce so now we can see that okay if we filter out all of that large-scale information these models they, they do reproduce many of these different features there are differences also but to some extent they can I mean the higher resolution here at 25 kilometer compared to a global model at 200 kilometer resolution we will have there is a Scandinavian mountain chain in this model with about 1000 meter highs or a little bit more than that and that will generate precipitation here so that's a uh, this is are some good features that show up if you look at the models on those scales where they are supposed to add some additional value on the, on these smaller scales uh, some other results from that project we looked at details of precipitation at different um, at different uh, percentiles so this is the median we looked at all days when there is precipitation so we just looked at exactly every day so at the median uh, in this pdf uh, then we looked at the biases in the different models these all of these different lines and colors are different different regional climate models and then we saw that okay well here at the, at the median the models they, they are differ differing from each other from say minus 20 to plus 20 percent something like that at the median but when we get here to the high end side these are the extremely wet days when as uh, so the 99th percentile so this is the the one one percent wettest days in in the long simulations the the cases that i mean why you have the headlines in the newspapers when when it rains a lot uh, differences are huge up here between different models so this is where these parameterizations in the models they differ a little bit between the models and it's quite sensitive so there are immediately very large large differences <coughs> sorry <coughs> So we try to compare different models to each other and understand why it looks like this to see <coughs> see what we can learn from that. Uh, <coughs> we can also look at even uh, I'm sorry <coughs> even farther out in, into the uh, <coughs> probability distribution. So now this is the 99th point ninth percentile. So this is really one in a uh, <coughs> one in a thousand cases. Uh, so these are very extreme precipitation from observations the whole bunch of models and then the average bias and, and then we try to see if there were any consistent patterns maybe the model was a bit wetter compared to the observations but there were also problems with the observations as was shown in in this one here so this is uh, <laughs> quite interesting this is the bias pattern in the in the combined large ensemble of many different regional climate models and this is the station density in the observational data set underlying it. And if you look at the patterns here, they are quite similar to some extent. So if there are, <laughs> in some places where we have little information uh, in this data set from Scandinavia, for instance, we have fairly large biases also in, in the observation. So in, in the model. So again, there are, there are some issues with, with uh, observations here and especially when you want to look at extreme conditions I mean this is a one in a thousand, thousand case so, so these are really extreme cases so in a statistical sense it's difficult to, to find these events actually just by go, going out measuring them there are not so many observations and the few that are there uh, if there are some errors that they, they can it, it's not so easy to compare with, with the models and this is what people are interested in extreme precipitation one thing that many people are interested in. I mean, this is really important for for infrastructure and, and things like that when we have flooding events and 
that's when we have difficulties, really, really difficulties evaluating our models. So, another question here is model res resolution high enough? Uh, when I show these figures from that project that was called Ensembles, we had 25 kilometer grid in these grid boxes. This is 50 kilometer grid. Um, illustrated here in this one here. This is the precipitation event we I showed before. So if you want to resolve this kind of precipitation associated with the typical cyclone in the frontal system, um, okay, here there is no possibility at all to capture such such details as we see in in the radar image below there. If you get to these resolutions, you, well, okay, you have a couple of grid boxes in this area, so you start seeing precipitation, but it's very difficult to get some of these more fine-scale structures at, at this resolution. So you need to have uh, to increase resolution even more, actually, to say something here. And this is now, we did some experiments at SMHI where we ran our previous version of our regional climate models at, at 50, 25, 12, and even down to 6 kilometer grid spacing. And uh, it's not so easy with observations. This is one data set. It only exists down to 25. These are observations, gridded observations. That would be, would be so therefore I have also uh, another analysis from SMHI just for Sweden here, saying something about precipitation in January, this is winter, so it's not completely comparable, but there are some interesting features here. So when we go from core, relatively coarse resolution here now to finer and finer resolution, we see quite big changes if you look, for instance, here in, in southwestern Norway. Uh, precipitation increases, the intensity, the most intensive precipitation increases with resolution. and the, that seems to be fairly similar to the what's observed and we also we know that i mean the we have the highest amounts on, on this side over here also if you look at sweden in more detail for instance now we can see that here it shows up a clear maximum here on the on the west side this is not very high down here in southern sweden for those of you know i mean it's just like two three hundred meters at most so it's it's not a high mountain or anything but it's enough to have a large impact on on the on the precipitation pattern, as you can see in the observations, we have a strong maximum here. It rains twice as much here compared to in on the east side of Sweden, and that is something such a model starts uh, capturing here, here actually. And so that's that's a good result, and that then advocates for for using this kind of higher higher resolution in the model. What did you say, Marcus? <laughs> Do you live in? No, no. Yeah. So tomorrow, Kari will tell us about everything about life here in the rainy place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's not just the seasonal mean features or the monthly mean features that gets better when we go to this higher resolution. We also uh, get intensity and duration in a better way. This is another study from from SMHI from a colleague who looked at uh, two places, one in Stockholm and one in Malmö, two cities in Sweden, where we have more high resolution in time precipitation information. So we can look at, at, at what is happening on, on different um, time scale, scales. So this is now, these are two di diagrams, one from Malmö in the <coughs> south here and one from Stockholm up here. They show the duration of rain events from starting from uh, zero up to one day. So this is the length of the precipitation event. So if it starts raining now and rains for three hours, then we will be here. And then it shows the intensity here on this axis. So this is often what you see. Uh, these are the observations in black. You see high intensities with short duration. And then intensity generally falls off when duration gets longer. Okay? So these are the heavy rain showers up here. And these are the uh, more frontal system precipitation, and this is uh, weaker frontal precipitation, etc. Uh, so, for a model to be good now, we we would like to see something looking like this, of course. And uh, if you now see these four four color lines here, this this refers to the four different resolutions we had here. 
going from 50 down to 6 kilometers. And you see going from red all the way to yellow, you see exactly this is what happens. The model starts to capture more and more of this high intensity, short duration precipitation in a, in a better way. So it, to some extent it, it better simulates these processes including, uh, that involves uh, the weather systems, the uh, extratropical cyclones, but also shorter um, precipitation events. So that's a, a very interesting result and it also advocates using higher and higher resolution in our, in our models. Um, so this is what we see now if you go back to this figure again. So starting out here going to higher and higher resolution we start to include more and more of these relevant features in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, I still continue in talking about this since this is very important and, this, and the central thing. This is again now uh, where we are a little bit. Uh, this is for, for, for a fictive, uh, fictitious grid box covering the, the Stockholm area. So the black one out here, that's, that would correspond to 50 kilometers. This is what was standard in our types of experiment 10 years ago. This is what we used in, in, in our ensemble. So if any one of you have used climate model data, you might have used data from there or for something this size grid boxes. Today we are kind of here, like we have a lot of data on, with this kind of resolution. And uh, we are working here and this is more of what I said written here like the, the this is probably where we want to go into the future to look at this really that should be read as well to look at these really really small small grid boxes the problem is here that every time we double the resolution we we require eight times as much computing resources so that's huge and this that means that uh, uh, this is uh, there, are, there are big question marks here we we don't know if we can really afford that and um, yeah so that's 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 the main main thing that we are working with right now right now and this is now I would just show two slides here saying something about why we want to go there this is a rain uh, hitting Malmö the third city of Sweden in the south here last year at one day uh, so these are observed precipitation this is now Denmark, you have Copenhagen here, Denmark, uh, Malmö is here uh, and uh, these pinkish colors here represent more than 60, what is it now, millimeters in, yeah, in this time period likely I think, yes. So very large amounts of precipitation, the city was partly flooded, you saw pictures in the, in, the, in the newspaper with buses floating around and all of that and, and the same thing goes for Copenhagen that was also hit a few hours later. Uh, that was observed and this is what the weather radar saw at the same moment. Here we have much better spatial coverage, here are only a few sites but here we have a better spatial uh, resolution. So this is now accumulated over these um, what is it, 12 hours, something like that, uh, precipitation in this area. It's quite localized, but it's distinct and uh, it's a more or less continuous precipitation area. And this is now a forecast from a global numerical weather prediction model. It's, it's global, but it's run at 16 kilometers, so it's still quite high resolution to be on a global scale. And it captures some kind of precipitation in this area, but it's nowhere near what we, what we saw in, uh, in, in, in Malmö on that day. Uh, here we have the forecast from the operational regional numerical weather prediction model made a few hours before, before the event when the model operates at this high resolution and then um, <coughs> it's partly by chance that the model gets the, the weather situation at the, or the precipitation at exactly the right spot. This is very close to the observations. Uh, and that's, that's a problem or a question for, for the weather forecasters to, to get this information in the right place. And, I, and I'm not talking about that right now. I'm more talking here about the ability of that kind of model to reproduce this kind of event. So a model at this resolution can really simulate precipitation extremes of this kind that we observed in the, that we observe in, in the atmosphere and that's a very good thing since then I think we can think of using these models also for saying something about uh, statistics of this kind of event or climate change
properties of, of this kind of event. So that's just one situation, but then um, in, uh, in the UK they did a similar study running a model for, for some eight, nine years, something like that. Uh, and did statistics now again on uh, spell duration, this is duration, intensity curves as we saw before. But here there it's, uh, uh, these are frequency plots now for, for different frequencies. So to the left we have the radar, so this is what it indicates that we have uh, most rain events, the, there, there are a lot of rain events here. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see you can see the frequency distribution here. So there are some <coughs> high high frequency, high high intensity, short duration events here that have s uh, quite some impact. Uh, that's what the radar gives, and this is then climate models at different resolution and their respective biases in this case. And what is seen? This is something we have generally seen with models at this kind of resolution, which is still high today, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not enough as it's shown here. These models, they constantly underestimate this kind of high intensity, short duration precipitation. There is an underestimation, a, a strong underestimation there, while there is a, an overestimation down here instead. So, so these models, they, they, generate, they generate precipitation a little bit um, too long and a little bit too weak and that's it makes a big difference to people looking at the impacts of this water hitting a city for instance if we are up here or down here so these high intensity short duration events will lead to strong flash floods in in the cities uh, of course and uh, if you don't if you can't sim simulate that that's that's the problem what they saw when they increased the resolution in the model was that the situation was very very much improved and this has also been shown for other climate models. So these types of very high resolution weather prediction models or regional climate models operated at high, high resolution can, to a much better extent, resolve these, that, that kind of feature. And that's, uh, I think that's a very good, uh, that's a, it's a very, very strong message that um, to us it says that we should really, okay, yes, we should use high resolution and, and, and better computers to do this. Yes, Corey. Uh, really no, in, in this case they, they, set, they set up the, the model only for, for the southern half of England basically, so that was a much smaller domain, it was not, not all of Europe, but uh, the problem is of course that the, if, you, if you want to do this on a, on a, on a scale like Europe, th there are people are interested in this kind of events not just in southern England but all of Europe, so we need to do that or at the larger scales with that high resolution, and then it becomes problematic, of course. So it's hmm. um. Okay, uh, so the rest of the time I will spend actually saying some things about how we use these models for, for climate change studies, but I think it's a good place for a break now since we have, I've been talking for more than an hour now, and um, Okay, should we go on? Yes. So for the last part now, I will quickly talk a little bit about how we use the regional climate model for, for climate change studies. Um, uh, much of what we do is related to future climate, of course. People are interested in that and, and we utilize these models and then there are some things to think about. So if you come to that situation at some point that you want to use output from regional or global climate models, there are a few things to think about, uncertainties etc for, for the future climate and I, I will try to at least touch upon some, some of these here. And again please interrupt me for questions whenever you like. Um, if we look first at different global climate models, as all models are, includes a lot of simplifications and they are they are just models and nothing else and they include different simplifications they are different all models will produce different results this is quite simple to understand uh, these two graphs shows climate change signals for uh, part of Sweden these are annual cycles for different months changes in temperature here 
and precipitation to the right from approximately 20 different global climate models uh, for one particular climate change scenario uh, the pictures show change in temperature and precipitation at the end of the century compared to the end of the 20th century. And as you can see, there are these lines, colored lines, representing different models and different changes. They are quite, they are quite different. So if you pick this blue dashed line up here and use that as your reference, or you pick this green one here, you will have different climate change signals. So this is a quite quite a fundamental thing to think about. You, you, there is not just one climate change scenario. But then working with this and trying to explain to people how to use this, we can start identifying common things between these different scenarios. We can for instance see that for temperature all of these scenarios show a dramatic increase in temperature of some 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 degrees. So there's a considerable increase in temperature. This is one thing they show at the end of the century and this, so it's a fairly strong signal. Another thing that they show this now, let's see now, the one of these lines is an average I think but I don't remember which one. It couldn't be that one, no. It's probably one of, oh, I don't remember which one. It's the black one, there is no black one here. No, it's a bit strange. Since the average cannot be up here. Oh, never mind. Uh, okay, we, we skip that. That's not so interesting. But uh, one thing that is interesting is that we see stronger warming here in the winter months compared to the summer months, at least in general. So that's also a message one can bring out of these models. But there are some individual models like this one here that shows a slightly different pattern. But by and large, most models show warming and there is a seasonal seasonal signature to it. And the same thing goes for, for precipitation. These models, they show changes. Uh, it's maybe difficult here to see if there is a increase or decrease on an annual mean sense, but it tends to be more precipitation in the winter and no big changes or possibly a decrease in summer for this area, southern Sweden, southern half of Sweden from these models. So there are also some, some common things, but uh, individual models show very, very different results. So this means that if we want to say something about climate change, use results from such models. Uh, we don't know, I don't know which one of these should be, should be used. There is not one. We, we have to face this kind of uncertainty and to, and to use, in some sense, the whole ensemble here. And an ensemble means many different simulations. Uh, so that is what some, something we work a lot with. So we try to use many different global, this is now global climate models. If we want to do something for, on the regional scale, we downscale these models. So we take a lot of these different models, and this is some of the experiments that I will show some results from before. We have used multiple different global climate models here with different abbreviations. We have done downscaling for different scenarios. This is what the crosses are uh, representing here. So at SMHI we have done like nine or ten different global climate models that we have downscaled to a high resolution over, uh, over all of Europe. And that information is what we try to present when we are out talking about this and, and people ask us about climate change uh, to, to get, have some idea about what, what it can look like. What is an RCP? Oh, that's good. Thank you, Marcus. That's, uh, that's uh, the, from the most recent IPCC report, this is how you describe the emission scenarios, the forcing scenarios for the future, the, the changes in greenhouse gases, for instance. And that's described with something called representative concentration pathway, saying something about the magnitude of the forcing. So this is uh, 2.6 watts per square meter. You remember when I started out, is they talked about watts per square meter, the solar constant and all that. So a relatively weak continued change. It's still a l huge difference compared to pre-industrial conditions. A larger change and a very, very large change. And this is at the end of this century. So we, here we have much, much, much stronger forcing, more CO2 in the atmosphere uh, changing things. Thanks for the question. That's good. There are always these abbreviations everywhere. You don't see them at the end. 
Uh, I will not read out these. These are names of <laughs> names of models. <laughs> I can do that tonight if you like. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, when we want to look at so okay, one more thing. Uh, these global climate models represent both today's climate and the future climate. All what I've shown before today has been when we have used reanalysis data close to observations on the on the on the boundaries of these regional models. So we had a really good picture of what the climate has been on the large scales, and then we have we see what how the regional model represents that. Now we have instead global climate models on the boundaries and they are not as good as the observations. So there will be some additional errors here to the post climate. And I will show you some some a few graphs showing what that can look like. So these are now historical simulations. First I show again or again this is a new picture but this shows uh, the mean sea level pressure. This is the, the pressure pattern with low pressure up here, high pressure down here. This is basically observations to the left. This is the Icelandic low for us climatologists. And down here we can find the Azor high out on the Atlantic. So these are climatological features, low pressure, high pressure, implying westerly winds, as I talked about in the previous first lecture. So we have, we have basically westerly winds or southwesterly winds towards Europe. This is now in winter. Uh, when these temperature contrasts and, and pressure contrasts are quite strong. So on average, westerly winds. If we now take the regional climate model, it's called RCA, and we force it with these observations from here on the boundaries out here, we prescribe the boundaries. We say that, okay, we have this low pressure gradient out here, we have a certain information about sea surface temperatures, etc. And then we simulate climate for a long time period. I think this might be 30 years or something like that, or 20. Uh, then we get a pressure pattern which is very, very similar to this one here. So we, and I've already said that, that th this kind of model can reproduce the large scale features of the, of the observed atmosphere. So that's, that's nothing new, but I would just have that for reference. If we now, instead of this one here, look at what will the regional climate model give if we use the global climate models on the boundaries instead. So we take prescribed conditions from the, these global models that we are using all the time. Then it looks like this instead. And you can see if I go back and forth here a little bit, you can see that there are indeed differences between these two. Okay. So, and what we see is that the low pressure system here is in a little bit different position. We can also see that, the, that the, all of these pressure lines here, ISO lines, they are a little bit different. So the large scale circulation is not really the same. So these global climate models uh, that lies behind the regional climate model simulation here, they, they have some problems and some errors. Uh, and this is indeed I mean, this is really a feature from the, from the global climate models. This is from, from the global climate models themselves. So these patterns are more or less the same. So this is something the regional climate model inherits from the, from the, from the large scale global climate model. So what is now the implication of this? We can look at this bias pattern to see what it looks like. So this is now the regional model driven by the global climate models, and this is the observations. So this is what it should look like. So we take this one here, minus that one there. So this is a difference field in here to the right. Uh, and this difference field shows a large negative bias here in the center of the, of the domain. And it shows positive biases up here and positive bi and biases. And biases then as deviations from the um, observations. As Marcus said talked about in the coffee break, what biases really means. That's deviations from the observations here. So there is a certain structure to it. Uh, and uh, this structure is quite important, since if you start thinking now about the westerlies here, and the westerlies are governed by the large scale pressure patterns. And if we have errors in that one, there will be also errors in the, in the westerlies and how the models represent the winds. And that looks like this. In this region down here, there is too low pressure here and too high pressure down here. That means that in this area, the 
north-southerly pressure gradient that drives the westerly winds, it's too strong. So here we will have two strong, two strong winds. So here we'll, the result will be too much uh, warm and moist air coming from the Atlantic into the model over the Euro Europe in this part of the domain. While up here it's the other way around, that's why I had a blue arrow up here. So here we have too low pressure, too high pressure. Here the, the westerlies will be too weak in that area. And I simply made a very simple thing here, just indicating that this is some kind of demarcation line here between too large positive biases in the westerlies and too weak biases. Okay, can you follow that one? Good. Since this is now the, the average over all of these nine different models that I will read out the names in the evening from uh, the abbreviations of, of these models. Uh, so this is an average out of nine different simulations. But then we can look at the individual ones instead. And they are here. So now there are many maps here. So we'll take it very easy. This is what you have already seen. Observations. And this is the anomaly, the ensemble mean. This is what we saw here. That one there. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different global climate models on the boundaries. And the error pattern in each and every one of them. And I've by hand just done some simple things like this, this pinkish line here, illustrating the same thing. Uh, so we see that basically in, in each of these models there is a similar error pattern here. We have some kind of strong negative anomaly in the, in the large scale pressure, implying two strong westerlies down here and two weak westerlies up here. This one here is <laughs> The bias, there is also a bias when we, when we downscale the observations with the model. There are some small biases, but that's com much smaller. And over the Atlantic, there is almost no bias at all. So we have the westerlies are correct here in this case. So we see there is a clear bias pattern associated with all of these nine different GCMs. And it's quite similar also in, in others that we have not, not yet downscaled. So what's now the implication for this? If we now look at some other variable, let's look at... I will show you now temperature instead. Yes, good. For yes. Example, in, there is one that is uh, completely different from the other. Yeah, you mean this one here? Or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's because we have quite a small area here. Y it is similar, although the bias pattern is shifted slightly to the south. You have this positive bias up here, which is also seen in, in some of the other ones, but it's, it's a little bit shifted. So, and that has, of course, an impact if you're interested in in back home in here in Portugal or, or somewhere else I mean where you are I mean that, that kind of um, uh, the, the bias pattern is is important for the, for the regional and local details of course yes uh, the next figure we show the same thing but that will be temperature biases instead we keep this pinkish thing here just to remind ourselves about that and whoops this is what we find now so if you remember South, this is now the ensemble mean again, south of this line, in general, there are two strong westerly winds bringing warm air that is too warm. So we have some problems here in parts of southern Europe. This is now the average. And in individual models, we see similar features in, in most of these models in this area down here. So there is, to some extent, uh, biases in the temperature that are re related to how this model simulates the large-scale circulation. While north of this line we see bluish colors in, in most of these indicating cold biases. So in these areas there is too little moist and, and warm air from the Atlantic coming up. So, so there are some, some features here that can be explained really by uh, uh, problems with the, with the large-scale circulation in, in the global climate models. And this is something we have to keep in mind when we want to look at the climate change signal. There are biases in, in, the, in the models in today's climate and how they represent the post-climate. Um, and um, so, so we might, we, uh, we have to, you might have to think about that depending on your application, what you want this data for. Yes. Uh, 
No, not really, since you need to have the entire globe. I mean, the, the, the atmosphere is global and, and, and it's, you cannot detach a, s a certain part anywhere. That, that's not possible. But there are other kind of modeling tools. There are, there are global models with, a, um, with higher resolution in some specific areas of interest, etc. So, you, so there, there are other techniques for, for, to, for dealing with that. But, um, you cannot start just with a region, a small region that has, doesn't really make sense. No, that's too bad. Um, and this is also reflected in precipitation. I don't think I have that one here now, but uh, in, in, in that kind of picture, you would see overestimations that are larger here in the south compared to in the north, depending on, on this now. Uh, and this has implications if you, uh, I heard that some of your interested in hydrological applications for instance and if you have a control climate the historical climate which is way too warm and too wet or too cold and too dry maybe then there will be problems uh, with your hydrological model and uh, I didn't prepare any slides on that or anything but there are methods for trying to so uh, what, what, what is referred to bias correct you correct you try to correct the results for, for the year for the biases and errors that are seen in the model in the in the past climate and then when you perform a climate change simulation you can use and assume that the biases are similar in the future and you use the same kind of correction in the future and that uh, adds some additional uncertainty to everything i would say so so you cannot i mean if you have a certain bias that is related to these large-scale circulation features and then you just apply that in the future, then you would assume that everything is, this, that these biases are the same and yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not certain. But this is not the topic for today really, but yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, when there are reports about future climate... Sorry, when there are... The reports about oh, okay. future mm -hmm. climate, uh, how many models are used to give the, say, the temperature That's very, I, I would say that's very, very different. I mean, now I present this one here it, mm -hmm. that has some nine models uh, underlying it. A few years ago, we had five or six or so, but uh, we have always tried at uh, SMHI to, to use relatively many different global climate models. But if you look at climate change studies 10 years old, and there was just one or two, and there are still a number of reports out there looking at impacts with only one or two models. And that, I would say, is something you, you really have to be very careful in, in interpreting these, that kind of results. So that's... Um, so the more the better. Not, uh, not just the more the better, but, but you, have to, you have to think about... Uh, I will get back to you, Marcus, but uh, I mean, you have to think about the spread here. Maybe you can, you can pick out one or two here that, are, that, have, that kind of span the uncertainty in some range, and, and then you can use them for your, for your application. You don't need to have uh, 10,000 maybe, but, but you can, if, if you cleverly sample the whole distribution, you can pick out those ones that make sense for you. Okay. Yes, Marcus. Um, so for the IP, latest IPCC, for instance, yeah. the, 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 the range of, when you say pick out, um, I mean, isn't it, shouldn't we say that um, all, the, all, all the different scenarios, all the different models, are equally possible, or are there better or worse ones? Uh, this is a. We say, yeah. Okay, this is the range, and also this applies to taking the mean. I mean, this, this mm -hmm. might be for, for technical reasons to, to, to check things and to, you know, make, maybe it's mm. to, make, to make an average of all these models. But mm. if you want to communicate that to the, to the public, isn't the, the, the mean is not more probable than any of the other, other models. Isn't it like that? No, definitely. You're absolutely right about that. I mean, this kind of data, this is now not from the latest GCMs, but it's a previous ver I think these are 20 different models now. There were 30 or something like that in the last one. But uh, this, the situation is pretty much the same now. And uh, as you say, taking an average here might be a quite a bad thing to do. Uh, it could be good, but then you should always reflect the 
uncertainty in, in some sense. Definitely, that's. Uh, and then there are there is a lot of ha has been a lot of thinking about trying to look at the, at the models in in the past climate to see how they represent the climate. Okay, this is a good model. It has very small biases. This one we should trust this one. And that might be a good thing to do, but at the same time you don't know if that model has the right response to the climate change signal. That's not certain. I mean, even if it's very good at today's climate, it doesn't maybe include a carbon cycle in the right way and then therefore the response is completely, completely lousy. So you have to think about all these different aspects. But, uh, but I think if you have impact studies and you want to show something, you should always try to reflect this kind of uncertainty somehow. Maybe you can pick three scenarios here. You can pick some, someone that is somewhere in the middle, a low one and a high one, and then that can maybe be used to illustrate the changes in, in river runoff, for instance, if that's, if that's what you're interested in. If you want to do something else, look at the damages to forests, maybe then there might other, be other things that are important, not just the, maybe the, 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 the precipitation fluxes, but some temperatures sometime over the growing season, etc. And then you might look, have to look into that kind of um, yeah, uh, result space to see how you sample that in, the, in, in a clever way to, to illustrate the uncertainties. This, uh, so, so I think it depends much on the applications actu actually. And there, there is ongoing research on that way where, where people try to look at, depending on the, on the impact modeling or the, or the result that you're interested in, you, you, you sample these ensembles in different ways. So, so there is some, some literature on that also. So that can be interesting. Yes, Marcus? The re reality is unfortunately a little bit um, frustrating. So we did this for the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we looked at the different models and asked ourselves which of all these atmospheric models we should use. Mm. And we compared the control climate with the observations and then immediately many of them we can rule out immediately because for the climate change impact studies they are not good enough. Mm. Then the number of models reduce uh, very much. And then you end up with some sort of mini ensemble that somehow reflects but certainly is not able to reflect the whole range of uncertainty. Mm. But you just need to do this uh, one <coughs> uh, request that the, the model at least somehow has something to do with today's climate in the ocean. Mm. Then not many are then, and then you have not so much choice actually. Now, of course, the, 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 the amount of models to, to pick from is, is not, it's not, it's limited definitely. And um, um, yeah, yeah. The, this is a problem, of course. We, we, and, and, the, and also, even if you look at all of these different models, they certainly do not sample all of the uncertainty space that is around. So they, I mean, they are they're restricted. So it's, um, they can be used to illustrate things, but it's very, very difficult to calculate any, um, to give in a very, very I mean, people are trying to, to, to work with probabilistic climate change signals, talking about risks and, and percentages here and there. But that's a, it's a tricky business still, I think, since the, the models are maybe not good enough and uh, there are not um, yeah, that many ensemble members, etc., that, that we should have, actually. So I just wanted to illustrate this case, since I think it's... I mean, these models that we have choose, used here, these nine models, these are, I mean, these are internationally well-known models. Some of them are, the, are kind of the best in, in reproducing the atmospheric circulation, etc. But still they have these biases. Now the colors are quite strong here, but the biases are there and, and it really has an effect on, on, the, on the climate in, 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 the, in the regional scale. So there are, there are still issues with these models that we are working on. Okay, so that was something about the historical simulations, the, 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 driving for the driving GCMs, and then I will just quickly show some results from, from what, they, what these models show. This is now um, uh, scatter plots showing for all of Europe changes in, in temperature and precipitation. This is with the regional model driven by these nine different global climate models. There is a lot of information here. Um, there are 
differences in three different time windows. Green is the near future, blue is the middle of the century, and red is at the end of the century. So you can see progressing, increasing change in temperature, for instance. And you can also see different emission scenarios with l less emissions and more emissions. So uh, the stronger the emissions are, the, the, the larger the resulting climate change signal. And here, if we have this kind of ensemble again, we do have some kind of spread here. So we, we can look at common features and we can also look at differences and again, try to talk about now if we can sample this in some sense to uh, capture whatever we like. Uh, we can also look at differences between the global climate models themselves and what has been downscaled. But I, I, that part, I will skip that, it's that one. Um, this is what it looks like in terms of if you want to look at distributions. Winter time temperatures over Europe. This is now the regional climate model up here. In the lowermost plots, it's the global climate model stems uh, directly. So you can look at control climate here to the left. The climate change signal is here. Uh, and uh, if we just look at this first, we see that for temperature in winter, we see a very large temperature increases and in particular up here in the north and that has to do with um, decreasing uh, snow and ice in that region so we have a strong amplification of the climate change signal in, in our part of the world up here close to the Arctic and then you can start looking at details as, as how these yeah, the spread over this ensemble and you can also see that all of these models agree on, on changes so it's a very strong signal it's very consistent among the among the models etc even if the details differ some somehow so that was for winter time temperatures and uh, then for summer time temperatures it's the pattern is different so then we have the strongest signal maybe here in the in the south instead in the in the mediterranean air area but also again up in the north there are changes up here in the in the arctic region that are really important um yeah i don't want to spend too much time on these results if you if you look at the at the summertime temperature now at the, at the place and not just at the seasonal mean you might be interested in things like heat waves and stuff like that so here is from one scenario one single scenario i just picked out data from from a grid box close to stockholm uh, and this is now summertime june july august so there are 30 years of data here uh, three months 90 days so it's 2700 days behind these statistics up here uh, in and in the model we see that okay me median temperatures are here close to 15 16 degrees something like that and then um, yeah and then you can see the distribution here and here you can see some percentiles this is the median quartiles and then you see the first fifth and tenth percentile i think it is so here to the left of this line is one percent of the data and then you can see what happens in the climate in the future you can see the whole pdf is shifted to the right so it gets warmer and warmer everywhere uh, and you can also look at the distribution here to see that it's maybe changing a little bit. It seems to be widening, widening a little bit in, in, in the spread. And this is what might be interesting then for the, if you're interested in what's happening at the tails. So you can look here at, at the change at different, for instance, like the coldest days in summer or, or the, the warmest days, what's happening here or there, other differences that are, are of interest. And then you can do this for, for one grid box like this or you can do it in a map format here like this so this is the same thing here but for the first five, fifth tenth etc median up to the 99th percentile so this represents the movement of these blue lines here uh, so the climate change signal and then you can see things that okay well for the warm summer climate in this particular model that seems to happen a lot at a, at a warm end tail so there is a re really strong change in the warm extremes for, for that for that kind of model and uh, if i would have shown the winter time temperatures you would have seen a tremendous signal in the north for the cold temperatures that cold days in the winter will be much 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 less frequent in the future and much less intense so you can start looking at these kind of features based on on these models if you're if you're interested in, in that for, for various impacts or, or so that was something on temperature. This is saying something on precipitation. 
same ensemble as I showed before, nine different simulations indicating now in summer increase in precipitation only here in the north, otherwise decrease in large parts of, of Europe. And this is governed by the large scale changes in, in, the, uh, in the global climate models. It seems to be quite consistent, the global models, uh, or the, most of the models say, says, says the same thing, increasing precip up here almost no models talk about increasing precipitation in the south. So that's a consistent pattern as well. This is for seasonal means and uh, this one here is for um, extremes instead in summer. So this is the really the uh, strong uh, precipitation events that occur on a statistical basis like once every 20th year or so. So it's the rainiest day in a 20 year period. So if you compare these two maps now, you see here the climate change signal indicates drier conditions in, in most of Europe, apart from up here. But at the same time, in summer, you can see that the, the rainiest days will become wetter in, in most of Europe. So whenever there is heavy precipitation, it might be more severe in the future. So even if the climate is drier on average, when there is a heavy rain shower or a convective or a frontal zone passing by, it can drop more precipitation. So these are, these are things that these models can show also. Uh, okay. That's something on extreme precipitation. This is now going back to this study from, uh, from the British scientists, which is really important and interesting in this context. You know, remember I showed this one before for the uh, post climate, but now it instead indicates the climate change signal. So duration of precipitation and intensity. And in a regional climate model of the, of the, this is quite high resolution today actually. There is some increase here, but if you increase the resolution in that to the, these really high resolution models that we saw before in a much better way resembles the reality and the, and the precipitation we observe outside. There is a quite strong increase up here. So that indicates that, we, that if we have models that really adequately can, can simulate that kind of precipitation, we also see a stronger climate change signal here. And this is the most high impact precipitation events we have. So these results are quite n new, but they are very, very important. And there is also, there is also another group that have seen similar things as well. So when we have better representation of processes, we might see a different climate change signal compared to what we have seen before. So that's quite an interesting, in interesting me uh, message as well. I think I have like a three, four slides more or something like that. Um, This is a very old result, but I, I want to, to use it to say something that, that these regional climate models can find some things that are not consistent among global climate models, uh, especially for small areas. And as we are here talking about, uh, at ASCA, talking about Baltic Sea conditions, I included this. This is an old result showing uh, wind speed changes over the Baltic Sea from a number of global climate models, indicating some modest increase but these uncertainty bars are uh, in all seasons basically encompassing the zero line. So these changes are, are really not significant actually. But then we downscale uh, in those days only two of these models. This is the, are the blue and, 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 and red ones here. And uh, we found something that was interesting that even if uh, the climate change signal was not that strong in the global models, we found things here in, in the regional model uh, with strong signals increasing wind speeds here in this area here. This one is then the blue one with small increases in, in wind speed all over. And this one has stronger increases, the, re the red one here. And again, the same, ki same kind of pattern. And this is really interesting since here in this high resolution regional climate model, we have a much better description of, of the Baltic Sea since that's really resolved. In the global climate model, there is basically no sea or not, not very much. And also, in this case, this was a paper by Marcus, and, and we had a coupled model. So Marcus had been involved in that, working also with the sea surface and, and the ice conditions. So there was a better description of sea surface and sea ice conditions here. And in the future, what happens with sea ice is that it disappears when it gets warm. And then, 
a warm open uh, sea surface ha has a different properties of course and, and that changes the situation in, in the lowermost atmosphere as well. So here we saw that higher resolution and a better description of that kind of process uh, could, could then identify common signals here that was definitely not seen in, in the global models. Now that's, that's an important thing I think where we can use these regional climate models. I think this was basically the law. I have one example more for possible applications of these models. We did some work a few years ago where we looked at different climates, not just today's climate and possible future climate, but we also looked at past climates. We looked at the entire glacial cycle, basically, 100,000 year period. So we did some, some shots here and there. We looked at uh, warm conditions, we looked at glacial conditions, and, and kind of relatively cold conditions where, we, where there were permafrost in large areas where we prescribed large areas of land ice so this is now the land sea mosque in, in our model in different climates um, with the, uh, here we added some uh, we melted the Greenland ice so the, the sea surface is, is lower here and, and there, are, uh, there were differences at least and the large land ices and in a high resolution regional climate model we can really prescribe something that really resembles a large ice sheet that can is difficult to do in a, in a global model in a good way so we had a lot of differences here with forcing conditions etc and then of course we produced a uh, climate for those uh, periods that were completely different to to what we see today and this is for one of these cases for a permafrost climate we call it and and we try to then compare model output to not to observations, since there are no observations, but to some kind of proxy data for climate. And that was a really interesting um, adventure. But that's, that's a topic for another talk, I think. Uh, but that was quite, quite interesting to see how these results could match or not match the proxy, uh, proxy data that were available at that time. So that's just a, an example of what these models can be, can be used for. I think basically that was it, yes. Thanks for your attention, for not falling to sleep so far. <laughs> okay, and if you have any questions, I'm here also tonight if you like. Okay, thanks. <laughs>